So welcome to the Beauty Science Camp. This is our first presentation of the day. My name is Jen. I'm the co-host and the other co-host is Michelle Wong, who will be presenting here for a Chemistry 101. Before we get into the questions, Michelle, would you mind introducing who you are and what you do? Hi, I'm Dr. Michelle Wong. I'm also known as Lab Muffin Beauty Science. I talk about the science behind cosmetics on YouTube, my website, and on social media. And so to get right into it, what are some basic chemistry topics that apply to cosmetics? There are a lot of topics that apply, and the reason is chemistry is a really broad subject. It's the study of matter, which is anything that is a substance that includes solids, liquids, and gases, and obviously that's all the ingredients we have in cosmetics. So there are a huge number of fields of chemistry that are relevant depending on what we're talking about. Some of the topics that tend to come up a little bit more are intermolecular forces and supramolecular chemistry, which is how molecules interact without actually reacting. There's chemical kinetics, which is where substances go and how they move. This is about things like energy, and it's really important with stability. There's also equilibrium, which is relevant to things like pH. It's what happens when you change the conditions of a substance and things like what happens when you put something on your skin. So understanding a lot of these topics means that you can choose the right molecules and make them do what you want them to do. So now to draw specific examples with formulation for some of what you've just talked about, we can get into the topic of chemistry in a bottle. So how do ingredients interact with each other? I know this is a pretty big question, but to distill it down to something that might apply to more cosmetics than just one. So every ingredient inside a product is going to be a chemical and chemistry explains how different molecules interact with each other so we can make a good formula. So we can work out how to make it stable and how to make these ingredients interact the way you want with your body. One interesting example I think is stability. Most cosmetic products are emulsions and these are mixtures of oil and water. It's a way of getting the properties of both worlds into the one product. So water is inexpensive, it feels light on skin and there are some ingredients that are water soluble. With oil, of course, a lot of ingredients are oil soluble, including oils. So we know from everyday life that oil and water just don't like to mix. So an emulsion is like a temporary, somewhat stable state. We call this kinetically stable. And this is a bit like a stack of rocks. So it is technically stable, but if you have a bit of energy added, then it's going to topple. So with chemistry, you can work out different ways to make this stack of rocks stay like that for as long as possible. So we can do like the chemistry equivalent of adding scaffolding around it or gluing the rocks together or choosing the rocks more carefully. This is also really useful as a consumer because if you have more energy, then stuff wriggles more. It's going to be more likely to break free of whatever formulating tricks and separate back into oil and water. So that's why heat tends to make your products separate more. It's better to have them cold, but not so cold that they freeze. Okay, so then moving on from chemistry in the bottle to chemistry on our skin. So how does chemistry inform how ingredients interact with a person? So your body is also made of molecules and forces and kinetics determines how the product molecules are going to interact with your body molecules. So for example, if you know what substances are in hair and where they are, that means you can work out where the ingredients go and where they're going to work. Another example are actors in skincare and the chemical field that's really relevant is pharmacology or medicinal chemistry. So when you're designing a product, you want to be able to work out how to make the active leave the vehicle or the base and go into the skin. Or you can design it so that the vehicle makes your skin more permeable, so the active ingredients can get in more easily. And the principles involved in this are the same as for drug delivery. Chemistry also helps us understand things like concentration. So I think most people know that higher concentrations tend to work better, but lower concentrations can actually work as well. So basically to work, an active ingredient needs to bind to something inside your body called a target. And once it hits that target, it'll have some sort of effect. Designing the actual active ingredient is actually part of medicinal chemistry. The binding is usually to do with intermolecular forces. One analogy is essentially, imagine you have an active ingredient, it's like coins and you're dropping them into a pool of water and trying to get them into cups at the bottom. So essentially, if you have a higher concentration, that means you have more coins that you're dropping at the target. So that means the coins are more likely to get into those cups, which are our target in this analogy. And this is called the law of mass action. 
But there are other ways to improve how many coins you get into the cups. So one example is there are lots of active ingredients in skincare that are unstable. And this is sort of like the coins have a really good chance of just dissolving before they get to the cups. So if you find out a way of making them not dissolve, like coating them in something, then you can use a lower concentration and you can still get the same result. I'm sure our audience has heard of pH and there are a lot of videos of influencers like just dipping pH testers in, I don't know, say Vaseline, maybe not quite getting it. So maybe we can break down the topic. So what do we mean when we say pH? What is it and why does it matter in the context of cosmetics? So this is going to be a very brief explanation. All of these are really brief. pH is to do with the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution. So if you have something that is more acidic, it has more hydrogen ions, it's going to have a lower pH. If it's more alkaline, then it'll have a higher pH, and that means we have less hydrogen and more hydroxide ions. And the reason hydroxide has suddenly turned up is because hydrogen and hydroxide are linked. They're formed when water splits apart. So when you have pure water, it's at a neutral pH because any water molecule that splits apart will form equal amounts of both. And so if you have any water hanging around, it'll make the hydrogen and the hydroxide ion concentrations adjust so that they are always mathematically related. So this is the equation, but you do not need to know this. So if you've heard that water-free things like Vaseline don't have a pH or at least pH isn't useful, this is why the water isn't there. So this pH no longer really has a good meaning. Hydrogen ions are really important because they can attach to some parts of some substances, including substances in your skin, and they change the properties. So for example, with skincare, if you have extra hydrogen, it can make an alpha hydroxy acid more oil soluble, and that's more likely to penetrate your skin. pH can also affect the stability of different substances. So for example, some preservatives will work better at some pHs. Hydrogen ions themselves can also act as a preservative. So one reason is because when you're at a low enough pH, you have enough hydrogen ions, and that means that those can attach to different enzymes and stop them from working properly. So these are the enzymes inside bacteria, so they can't really survive. So pH is really important in cosmetic formulas because it can affect so many things, but as a consumer, you don't really need to worry too much about it because if you buy a product from a good brand, the formulator would have worked all of this out for you. You can't really affect the pH yourself. You can't really change that. So yeah. Just buy a product that has the right pH, it's been formulated well, and you don't need to worry about testing it. Yeah, don't worry, the pH is already balanced. And maybe that's a bunk claim. And so I'm sure our audience at this point is wondering, where can I learn more about this topic? So Michelle, where can people learn more about chemistry? There are heaps of online sources for basic chemistry, and I think having a really good grounding in that is so useful when it comes to understanding cosmetics. So some really good sites I love are Coursera. Um, Crash Course on YouTube has tons of really good videos, and there's also an app called Brilliant, which is great for learning chemistry. Well, that concludes our Chemistry 101 presentation by Dr. Wong, and now it's time for Q&A from you guys. We had lots of questions come in. We have very little time to get through them. So I will get straight to the chase. The first question came from, I'm sorry, I'm gonna try to pronounce your usernames. Ah, in a sheet mask, do the ingredients separate when we store them in a refrigerator? I guess it kind of, not really. It depends on what the ingredients actually are. So when you put things in the fridge, everything slows down a bit. And some things become less soluble. Well, most things become less soluble. So it's possible that when you put it in the fridge, some of the less soluble ingredients might crystallize out and you might get like gritty stuff there. Um, But otherwise, generally, no. Generally, when you put things in a fridge, things are usually reasonably stable. The next question is from Three Year Challenge. When using products with active ingredients that are fat soluble, for example, retinoids, together with fatty moisturizers, will they get trapped in the moisturizer or am I overthinking it all? That's actually a really good question. Um, And yeah, in general, it's really hard to say in general because a lot of these things, they depend on so many different factors. So as well as like oil solubility, which you pointed out, um, there's also things like molecular size and also what else is in the formulation as well. So 
Yeah, in general, um, I would expect fattier substances to not deliver as well from a fattier sort of base, but we do have lots of exceptions. So with um, tretinoin specifically, there are studies that found that tretinoin was delivered better from a cream than a gel, even though you might expect that the cream wouldn't work as well because it is a bit fattier. And so you'd expect tretinoin to stay in the cream compared to in a gel, but yeah, there's lots of other things involved as well. And usually you would have to test it. The next question is from Lena who asks, regarding Korean skincare products, does it really work to be wearing an essence, ampule, serum, and a moisturizer all in one go? That is a good question. Um, honestly, I think it depends on your skin. Um, with Korean skincare products, there are a lot of different names for products that are essentially serums or essentially really light moisturizers, and a lot of people do tend to layer them. But even with a lot of Koreans, they don't actually use every step in a like when you see those infographics with like all the Korean skincare steps, most Koreans don't actually do all that. They'll just pick a bunch. Um, so yeah, it depends on the products as well. So sometimes you'll get a product that has a lot of active ingredients in it. And so that one product might replace four other products. Um, and some people like having a long routine. Some people like that sort of routine and that um, almost ritual of doing all of those um, doing all of those steps, it's like they find it relaxing. I personally am like the opposite. I'm very minimalist. I like to just slap on two products maybe um, every night. So yeah, I think everyone can get a good routine, whether it's a lot of products or not a lot of products. There is a lot of preference involved, I think. Uh, the next question is from Artisan, who asks, how do the new foundations that have skincare in them react with SPF? Even when you leave 15 minutes before application, do these foundations deplete the SPF? That's a really difficult question. So there is a study where um, there's only one study where they looked at uh, putting on foundation after sunscreen, and they found that it actually added to the sun protection. Um, and I think the reason is actually because iron oxides, which are the skin colored pigments, and also titanium dioxide, which is the white colored pigment, they will actually absorb a bit in the UV range. Um, we don't really talk about that much, but that's one of the reasons why um, tinted foundations work well for protecting against blue light. They absorb blue light, but they also extend um, some of their absorption into the UV range. So I think in general, it's really hard to say because there are so many different sunscreen products and so many different foundations and so many different application techniques. Like you can't really, I don't think a blanket sort of statement would work, but I think it is probably safest to let your sunscreen dry down as much as possible and then try to put on your foundation as gently as possible. Okay, so this next question is from Irene who asks, Oh, what are the differences between retinol and granactive retinol? Is it the same thing? Is the second one a form of less irritating retinol? What's going on with this? That's a really good question. Um, I am working on a video on all of the different retinoids. Um, I don't like saying that because I sometimes I end up giving up on projects because they're too hard, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to get to the end of this one. Um, but yeah, um, the difference is Granactive retinoid is a particular type of cosmetic retinoid. So it is um, hydroxypinacolone retinoate. Essentially, it is um, retinoic acid, which is tretinoin, um, but the end, the final hydrogen, is replaced with a hydroxypinacolone um, thing. So it's sort of like a blocked off tretinoin. So you might have heard that. Um, Granactive retinoid works better than retinol. I don't think that's actually supported by the evidence, but the reasoning is because um, it doesn't, it just needs to have the hydroxypinacolone chopped off um, to be active. Whereas with retinol, it needs to be converted through two oxidation steps. Um, so yeah, it's like less steps before it's active, but at the same time, the quality of evidence isn't really there, I think, for granactive retinoid. Um, and most people tend to find it a bit gentler there's a bit of uncertainty about whether it's because it's not working as well or if it is actually gentler. But um, yeah, I personally would probably go for a well-formulated retinol product over an active retinoid. And that's all the time we have for this Q&A. Uh, thanks, Michelle. And we will go on to our next presentation by Dr. Crystal Porter on hair.
Hi everyone, I'm really excited because we have Dr. Crystal Porter here to talk about hair. Before we get started, can you tell us a bit about yourself and what you do? Hello, um, as you said, my name is Crystal Porter. I'm a hair scientist. I've been in the industry since the year of 2000. And as a hair scientist, I try to understand the effects of products, treatments, the environment on hair quality. And so it's a passion of mine to continue to understand hair, particularly hair of African descent or curlier hair types. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Hair science is really complex, and I think it really helps to start with what hair actually is. So can you give us a bit of an overview about the structure of hair? So hair has three major components. You have the outermost layer, which is the cuticle. Then you have the load-bearing component, which is responsible for the strength of hair, which is the cortex. And then you have in thicker hair fibers, typically a medulla. That is really a part of the hair fiber that isn't very well known, but they have found recently that it tends to have some lipid components in there. So there's a lot to continue to um, find out about it. As the cuticle is the protective layer, the cortex is responsible for the strength. When you go a little deeper, you can actually have more complex structures. And so the smaller components have like the cuticle, you have the cell membrane complex, also known as the CMC. And that is how water and other ingredients that are small enough to penetrate inside the hair actually gets inside the hair. And then to keep things simple when it comes to the cortex is made up of long fibrils that make up the keratin that we oftentimes hear about. Surrounding those fibrils are the amorphous matrix. So we hear so much about hair damage, but what exactly is happening when hair is getting damaged? Hair damage can be defined as what I would say a permanent modification of the structure in hair that would lead to a compromise in this overall integrity. Since hair is made up of proteins that are relatively larger molecules, these molecules have atoms held together by molecular bonds. And when these major bonds are broken, then that is really what causes the damage in hair. And what would you say are maybe the top three things that contribute to hair damage? The top three, I would say mechanical manipulation. So you have that outermost layer, which is the cuticle, and sometimes you can abrade it. It can crack or lift or break away. You can even mechanically inadvertently elongate it by pulling it, and that leads to a loss of elasticity. Then what's also popular is chemical treatments, such as coloring, perming, relaxing the hair, and those break those disulfide or covalent bonds in hair. And then maybe thermal processing where you degrade the protein. That is really a change in the protein structure. So when the heat is too high, you can just change the structure where it leads to catastrophic failure. I think... You of all people could probably talk for like a week about hair ties, but can you give us a very brief overview of hair ties and how that can change how people might want to manage their hair? So if you think about the global view of hair, you can readily see differences in the characteristics such as the length of hair, the density, the color, the thickness of the strands, obviously the curl or the shape of hair. All of that really gives us our unique style. But when you have the curl in hair, it was demonstrated back in the 1990s that there are two major factors that contribute to manageability, and those are hair length and curl. If manageability is described as the ease in which one can manipulate the hair, I think one would agree that it's easier to manage shorter hair. And similarly, I believe most would agree that it's easier to manage straighter hair types compared to those that are curly. However, there is a spectrum of curls, and that is why people sometimes use curl typing or curl descriptors to describe the degree of curl. I would say that there are generalized characteristics of hair, and those with curlier hair types say that they need more moisture. And so that is a fact when it comes to curlier or longer hair. It is indeed more manageable in the wet state compared to straighter hair types. You want to make sure that when you are considering the curl in hair, you realize that 
you have less force or your hair or you feel less force when your hair is wet when you manipulate it. So that's one of the reasons why we can really depend upon hair typing or curl typing to describe our hair. And hair repair is a bit of a hot topic. So how would you say we can repair our hair or at least make our hair feel a bit nicer? Yeah, so hair repair is a little misleading, (laughs) but for the sake of argument, I would say that you can temporarily mask the effects of damage. And I actually like the analogy that some of my peers in the industry have used, because if you think of hair as a fabric or hair that as a, a fiber, like a fabric, and you iron this particular fabric and you mechanically manipulate it time after time and it becomes weaker, it would be pretty nonsensical to think that you can repair the fabric by using a conditioner on it. You know, you can make it feel better, but is it going to overall repair it? No, it won't. So we can use different products that contain different polymers to help fill the voids from damage. And there are other film formers and lubricants that you can use to coat the outside to make it feel better. What are some common misconceptions about hair that you'd like to debunk? Yeah, I would say that one major one has to do with gray hair. (laughs) And most people, when they get grays, they say, oh my God, it's very unmanageable compared to pigmented hair. And that would suggest that the mechanical properties are different when comparing the two. And what we have found is that it really depends. <laughs> your hair and well, your gray hair can actually be more difficult to manage or it can be easier to manage. And so those properties will depend upon the individual and not necessarily just lumping all gray hair together. We don't know why some gray hair is more unmanageable compared to others, but there can be differences, no differences at all. So we don't know that is subject dependent. Another one um, has to do with sulfate-free shampoos, thinking that that is best for the hair. And that is not necessarily true. The overall function of the shampoo is to cleanse. It's not that sulfate shampoos are bad, It's just dependent upon the final formulation. The other thing I already hit at all already is about repairing the hair. People think that we can, and the unaltered state of the hair is the best in terms of its integrity. And when it's damaged, there is no way that you can repair it. So that's something else that a lot of people believe. I'll say the last thing is um, moisture is good for the hair. And I think that that's too general of a statement water molecules go into the hair and it makes the hair feel more pliable. So when you have curlier hair types, then that is something that feels, uh, that is advantageous to us, you know, because we want to decrease the chance of tangles. And so when it's more pliable, our hair fibers slide past one another more easily. Um, But we have to keep in mind that hair is the most fragile when it's wet. So there is a trade-off and one must be extremely careful when manipulating hair when it's wet. While moisture is good for manipulating curlier hair types, you just got to be careful. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. Do you have any takeaways that you'd like to leave us with? I guess the takeaways is um, hair has some basic components, but there are definitely differences in the shape and quality of hair. And that is measured by damage or that is equated to damage. And that can be the ultimate driver for what the hair needs. I would also say that hair manageability is dictated by the degree of curl and the length in hair. So when you think about manageability, you can't just put it all under one bucket and say, okay, this particular hair is more manageable. And so it's going to apply to all hair types. That is not necessarily the same. The other takeaway is that you can't repair hair. So you have to rely on masking the damage, but usually when you have damage, it's easier and better to just cut it. And then you must be careful when manipulating the hair and um, especially when it has a lot of moisture. And then keep in mind that marketing terms that describe benefits are mostly consumer driven. And so to increase your chances for success and satisfaction, you need to make sure that the brand shows efficacy with the data 
of the finished product on hair and that it is indeed represent, representative of your own. Thank you so much. So now for our audience, it's time for the Q&A. And now we're into the Q&A for Dr. Porter's presentation. We only have five minutes again. So I will get straight to this, try my best to pronounce your usernames. So the first question comes from Aishwara. Aishwara, please correct me. Uh, what ingredients would you recommend to be used for damage or frizzy hair? Hmm, damage or frizzy hair. So... Sometimes I can answer ingredient questions. So um, as a hair scientist, I am not a hair care scientist. And the difference between the two is, is the hair care, hair care scientists typically have more education in formulation. But um, frizzy hair, so damaged hair, their um, panthenol seems to have um, some uh, data to show that it definitely helps um, there are some others out there. I would defer to my friend and colleague, Angela Ellington, but for frizzy hair, frizzy hair doesn't necessarily have to be damaged. And depending upon what you're trying to do, probably tame the frizz. Um, I oftentimes love, um, silicones are great. Um, and other polymers that help to coat the hair to decrease the rate of penetration of water molecules, so. Well, this is a question that came up later in the chat. Are silicones bad or good for your hair? So maybe we can just this, bust that myth. Yay or nay to silicones generally? Are they oh God, the I'm demon mean. ingredient everyone thinks? <laughs> I love silicones. <laughs> no, I do not <laughs> believe that they are. <laughs> they should not be put on the bad list. I absolutely love them. But if you think about it from an environmental standpoint, sometimes um, the larger molecules that, you know, don't break down are bad for the environment. But as far as usage and damaging the hair or not being good for the hair, no, that is not true. Stay tuned on my podcast. I have a conversation with Mike Spavola coming up all about silicones and their environmental impact. Okay, the next question is from Curious Danish who asks, what would be better to brush wavy hair with wet or dry hair? Brushing hair? Yes. Wet oh, hair yeah. or oh. dry hair? <laughs> oh my goodness. So for one, I would say if you could avoid brushing, um, I would say try to manipulate the hair without brushing just because you increase the forces that the fibers feel essentially. And so you want to maintain the integrity of the hair. And so the less that you can, or the min if you can minimize the amount of tension or pulling on the hair, the better. And so I wouldn't say brush it, but if you had to, because I do understand that it is ideal for alignment of the fibers, I would say to definitely brush dry hair <laughs> and not wet hair because your hair fibers are in a more compromised state when it's wet. Um, you tend to like plasticize or soften that outermost layer, which is the cuticle layer. And uh, you don't want to remove it and you are more likely to remove the cuticle layers in this wet state. In addition, um, because the hair is softer and a little bit more plasticized, it can break more readily. So you want to manipulate whether it's brushing or combing in the dry state. However, there is always that caveat because if you have curlier hair types, then you have more ease of combing, meaning that you decrease the forces that the fibers feel when it's in a wet state. And so I know it's a tendency to want to manipulate curlier hair types when it's wet, but you have to be extremely careful. So you have to make sure you have good conditioning agents to try to uh, alleviate the, the fact that you can compromise your, your hair. And that's all the time we have for this Q&A. Five minutes really goes by quick. But for you guys in the audience, we've written down all your questions. So we will try to post this on the Beauty Sci.com social media uh, answers to your questions in the coming weeks to months. And also, if you want more from Crystal, uh, she was on my podcast recently and a really informative 
one hour conversation. But with that, thank you so much, Crystal. And we're on to the next presentation. Our next talk at Beauty Science Camp is from Jen Novakovic. It's going to be on environment and sustainability. But before we get started, Jen, can you tell us a bit about yourself and what you do? Thanks for the introduction. I'm a science communicator. You'll know me from the EcoL platform, and I'm also a cosmetic scientist. I started off as a formulator and transitioned to sustainability, and I'm currently doing a PhD in environmental sustainability, which is the topic of this presentation. And I specifically research how misinformation is impacting sustainability. So these days, I think we see a lot of environmental claims about cosmetics, and it makes sense because a lot of us are realizing that what we do has a really big impact on the environment. So before we get stuck into that, can you give us a quick overview of what sustainability is and what it actually means? Because it is a really complex concept. Sustainability is certainly a nebulous topic. There's a lot to it, many angles you can take it. I'll start with the basics, which sustainability is about doing things now that will be viable into the future in terms of the society, for the social aspects of sustainability, in terms of our economy, obviously in terms of the gram. Historically, as we started to think about sustainability, move to the nested theory of sustainability, where the economy lives in the society. So without society, you would have no economy. And then that lives in the environment because without the environment, there would be no society, there would be no economy. A popular framework right now is the planetary boundaries. So when we're thinking about how we're doing things in society, well, are we able to do that within these different boundaries of what we have available to us as humans on the earth? There's a lot to unpack with sustainability, but I hope that gives a good picture of some of the concepts that we should be thinking about when we're thinking about sustainability. There are a lot of green claims that you'll see on products. So labels like organic or all natural, recyclable, plastic-free, water-free, carbon neutral, out of these, and I'm sure you have more examples, which ones are worth looking out for and which ones are just BS? So I think most of the marketing regarding sustainability is could be better. So I'll maybe go through one by one some of the claims that you talked about. So firstly, with natural. Well, the place that an ingredient comes from doesn't necessarily tell us that much about its safety or environmental impact. We don't know how it's harvested, for example. So is that natural ingredient wild harvested? Well, wild harvesting is a significant threat for biodiversity. You don't want to do that. You want to cultivate. Is that natural material when we're cultivating competing with food crops? Well, there's an issue there because as we know from a lot of research, the largest impact that we have on, for example, biodiversity is the expansion of agriculture. So something that we have to think about when we're thinking about natural claims, natural does not tell us whether our product will be sustainable. Organic, well, a lot of this is kind of along the same lines, but you also have to bear in mind that the expansion of agriculture is a significant threat for biodiversity and also for climate change. And you might think, well, we're planting plants that are a carbon sink. Well, what are you removing in order to plant these plants? There's studies showing how organic agriculture in certain settings actually are more impactful. So it doesn't really tell us that much about the end impact of a product, let alone the social impact. Recyclability claims, I think that these are probably better, but it depends on the region. There's more regulation going on to ensure that there is clear recycling claims depending on the region. There's a bit of noise. I think a tip for you at home as the consumer is just to maybe check in with your local recycling infrastructure to see what's recyclable because depending on the regional regulations, Sometimes products have recycling claims and the product isn't actually recyclable in your region, but that's not always the case for regions that have stronger regulations around recyclability claims. So when in doubt, it's always a good idea to just contact your local waste management to see what's recyclable in your region. Plastic free, I mean, that is misleading because sometimes when you look at LCA data, using plastic over other materials can drastically reduce the carbon footprint. There's a lot 
to the environmental impact of products. It's not just end of life. You also have to think of beginning of life. What's the transportation like? What are the impacts like to produce glass compared to uh, plastic? Well, it's actually a lot more intensive to produce glass or cardboard or aluminum. Glass is heavier than plastic. Plastic is very light. You need less material compared to glass. You need more material. You can't just have this like very thin layer. It'll crack. So plastic free isn't necessarily greener. And I think that is misleading the market into thinking that water free. What are we re replacing water with? Because when you look at formulation LCAs, the largest impact in a formulation is actually emollients. So are you just going and replacing the water with emollients? Well, what's the end impact? When we look at the impact of products, the greatest impact typically for products is consumer use, that consumer use phase particularly with warm water consumption. So if you switched your cleanser with water, that's really effective at washing off the skin with a uh, oil or maybe even a solid format, how much more water will there be required? There have been LCAs for certain product types where they compared solid waterless formulas to their liquid counterparts, specifically with uh, toothpaste toothpaste in tubes versus toothpaste tabs. And they showed that the toothpaste tabs were more impactful. It was primarily attributed to the higher water consumption required. Well, specific measurement around impacts, greenhouse gas emissions is probably out of the claims that you've talked about, less misleading, but there is obviously an opportunity for confusion. And so that's where maybe talk to the brand to get more information. So you've busted a lot of myths there for us. Do you have any other common misconceptions you want to debunk? I think the biggest misconception is that cosmetic products can be sustainable because consumerism is the most impactful thing we do societally. We have an issue with overconsumption. Can a, a product that encourages more consumption be sustainable? There's often this misconception that you can support the environment by investing in green innovation. And now there's also been research showing that overconsumption in terms of impact outweighs any of the benefits attributed to green innovation. So like the biggest thing we can do is to consume less. So if you're buying some natural product that has a shorter shelf life, is that actually less impactful than the synthetic product that has a longer shelf life that you're more likely to use all the product? But the big thing is around cosmetic products can be sustainable. Instead, I would prefer to know because it's about doing less bad everything that we do has an impact. It's about, for brands, tell me how you're reducing your impact instead of misleading me by saying that you're sustainable. So you've talked a little bit about how important it is for brands to actually account for their environmental impact. So quantitatively measure things like how much energy they're using, how much energy they're saving perhaps by switching to something else. So how exactly is sustainability substantiated and why is that so important? Oftentimes, as you may have learned through this presentation, our assumptions around sustainability end up being wrong. If we're just assuming that something's going to be less impactful, when we actually go and measure it, like it might not be. For example, the assumption that glass is better, the assumption that solid is better. The only reason why I had that stat about toothpaste tabs is because somebody went and did a comparative LCA. You're just shooting in the dark without any kind of accounting. And accounting makes everyone accountable. You can't be accountable unless you actually know what's happening. And so this is why it's really important to measure things. There are a number of ways that brands can think about substantiating sustainability. A lot of times it ends up being around the material type is it natural or not but again that doesn't really tell us that much so instead looking at the supply chain ultimately they just need to know where is my material coming from because supply chains are very complicated and what are the impacts along the way because there are steps for products or ingredients to get to the brand let alone from the manufacturing to the consumer there's many things in the life cycle of the product that happen in each thing has an impact. In order to know the impacts of a product, you have to measure each thing. Life cycle assessments are arguably the most important tool that any product on the market can use to understand and quantify the impact of a product. Thanks so much, Jen. Now it's time for the Q&A. 
Thank you so much, Jen, for such an interesting presentation. We've got a whole bunch of questions on sustainability, and they're all kind of technical, which makes sense because sustainability is so technical. So we've got one from Nutram, which is, do you think a sustainable container like a glass jar could impact the quality of the product? Uh, certainly, there can be interactions from product to packaging. It, I would also just like sustainable packaging. I would um, I would question that because there's no panacea for sustainability and packaging. Everything has its pros and cons, just like glass does. Um, but certainly there can be interactions. The only way brands can know this is it's really important for them as they do product development to do packaging compatibility testing with their formulation. So there can be interactions. So that's why it's really important for brands to go and test their product. So um, there's a few packaging questions, which I think were actually answered in your talk a bit later. So I wanted to jump to one that was about ingredients, which is uh, from Fernando Ruiz, which is, I've heard that synthetically made ingredients are better for the environment than natural alternatives. But how are synthetic ingredients like vitamin C made? And I actually wanted to add to this, my own question. Um, can you also name like two ingredients that you think are really underrated in terms of sustainability and two that are really overrated? Because I think that would be interesting for me at least. Okay, so, well, first I'll just say, just like the blanket statement, natural equals greener is not accurate so is a blanket statement that synthetic equals greener. It's complex and it depends, sometimes natural is a better option depending on what's happening with the supply chain, how it's produced. Sometimes the synthetic option is better. In terms of how are they produced, uh, there is such a wide variability for how these ingredients are produced. Uh, with, for example, the case of vitamin C, that's actually a, a fermentation related reaction via biotech. Uh, so that it really varies. It varies so much. So it's hard to give one answer to cover all of synthetic ingredients. Um, whether or not a synthetic ingredient is better or worse, yeah, it's really complex and it depends. And so that's why for each individual ingredient, if we wanna know what's better, we have to actually go and measure it with things like LCAs. Okay, so then what ingredients are overrated or underrated in terms of their sustainability? Ah, uh, I mean, Many of the natural ingredients, I guess, uh, for underrated, uh, I think glycerin has a really interesting story. And uh, just because it can be kind of considered an upcycled ingredient from biodiesel production. Uh, yeah, now, like there's issues, sustainability issues with bi biodiesel production, but it is something that's there and there's a lot of glycerin byproduct that is produced out of it. And so then with glycerin, the fact that it's a byproduct, I would say that's a fair, that's a fair claim for the ingredients. There's also a lot of innovation that's from glycerin to produce many, many different ingredients. So I would say, yeah, glycerin is one of those underrated, but it has a pretty cool uh, sustainability story in my opinion. Another question, there's been a lot of questions about recycling. So I think maybe I'll just kind of mush them into one question. Um, can you talk a little bit about whether or not recycling actually happens for like smaller cosmetic packaging and like maybe packaging that isn't monomaterial? And also, what do you think about refill products? Oh, this is a hard question to ask with one minute remaining, or <laughs> remaining on the Q&A. I'll Sorry. try my best to quickly answer. So for recyclability, like there's so much variability from region to region. Usually though, smaller packaging, it doesn't end up being uh, recycled. So that is a challenge for recycling smaller packaging sizes. There probably is some exceptions with recycling streams. So like the best thing for you to do as a consumer is to just go and call your local municipal waste management to see what specifically they are recycling because it's going to be different from each region. For refillables, Oh, it depends on how companies are doing this. Like, is it something that company or consumers have to go ship back to the company? Well, what's the impacts associated with shipping to and from for the material? Is it like a cartridge? How heavy is a cartridge? And what's the benefit of that versus just like one monomaterial PET 
a pa- packaged product. If consumers have to go to a store to get their products refilled, well, it could be great for people who live close by, but then for people who live outside of a city that have to drive in, well, firstly, is it accessible to the consumers? Are they likely to continue to do it? Because you need to have consumer compliance for sustainability programs to actually be sustainable. Um, and yeah, what the impacts of transportation, but that's all the time that I have. So I'll just stop talking there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jen. And for everyone in the audience, don't forget that Jen has a really cool podcast where she talks about lots and lots of topics like sustainability in tons of depth and also follow her on Instagram. She talks about sustainability there. And we also made a YouTube video together, which is on my channel, which if you haven't watched, please watch it. Um, it goes through a lot of the other questions that some of you had. Um, but yeah, that's all the time we have. So let's go on to the next talk, which is by Dr. Gabriella Backy. I'm with Dr. Gabriella Backy from the University of Toledo, and we're going to be doing a fireside chat on formulation. But before we get into that, Gabby, would you mind introducing who you are and what you do? Of course. Thank you for having me, first of all. So I'm Dr. Gabriella Bakke. I'm an associate professor at the University of Toledo College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, and I'm the director of our undergraduate cosmetic science and formulation design program. So in these roles, I teach in classrooms and labs. I do research with students, and I also advise students. And we're going to start the conversation with a groundwork building question, and it's pretty big. And I think maybe your answer might highlight the complexity behind formulation, because I think a lot of people don't realize how complicated and diverse formulations can be. So can you describe a basic formulation makeup? All right. So that's a really complex question in itself. So I think I need to start with formulations can come in many forms and consistencies. So we scientists tend to describe them as liquid forms. Think of your liquid hand soap or liquid makeup remover. They can be semi-solids. Think of your facial moisturizer serum or a sunscreen. They could also be solids. Think of a pressed powder or a lipstick. And so what goes into a formulation depends on many things. For example, what I just mentioned, what form, what consistency is it going to be? Also, what body surface we're putting it on? Is it applied to the skin or the hair or the nails or other surfaces? Also, is the product going to be left on the skin or washed off of the skin? And also, when you select ingredients, we have to take into account the claims that we would like to make at the end, hopefully to support those claims from the beginning. And so just to break down a couple of Typical formulations, for example, if we think of cleansers, their main job is to clean surfaces. So you need the cleansing ingredients, which are called surfactants. And then so you will combine surfactants with other ingredients such as water and then preserve it. And then you can add some other ingredients to kind of build your marketing story. But the core is really going to be your cleansing ingredients. When we think of emulsions, that's a bit more complicated product form because we're trying to combine ingredients that naturally don't mix, oil and water don't mix, but scientists can mix them using another type of surfactants, we call these emulsifiers, which will allow us to combine oil and water and create a product that stays stable for a longer time. I mentioned serum earlier, a couple of minutes earlier. Actually, when it comes to serums, I've seen products that come in a dropper and were actually a liquid consistency. I've seen serums that came in a pump bottle and were more like a lotion. And I've also seen serums that came in a jar and were like a cream consistency. So sometimes it depends on what the brand believes that the product form should be. But I hope this gives some insight to the complexity of what goes into a product. That's a very thorough but succinct answer. Yeah, and then moving on, building on what you were talking about, you've already brought up some ingredients. So what are the different types of ingredients that chemists might use in a formulation and how do they add to the formulation? What are they doing there? That's a great question. So think of formulations as a chassis of a car. We have to have a framework. We call it the base when it comes to cosmetic products. So those will 
have the ingredients that you really need to make the product work and for the product to be stable. So these will be your core ingredients, such as your, if we think of an emulsion, it will be your oil and the water and the emulsifier and the preservatives and the thickeners that will sort of create that stable product. And then you can decorate this product with other ingredients that will help you create the marketing story, will help you harmonize the product and the packaging, will really create that emotional response from the consumer when they touch the product. So I think the easiest way to think of it is you have the base and then you have, I usually describe it as sprinkles in my class, but I think of it as decorations that we add to the product. Continuing to build on this, some ingredients don't work together. Some ingredients don't work within a given formulation for many reasons. For example, maybe it's like a preservative. It's only functional at X pH range. Can you talk about ingredient to formula compatibility and how does this inform the selection of ingredients? And to go beyond this, when you say compatibility, I usually think of three things immediately. One would be the ingredient ingredient compatibility within the formulation. Second would be the ingredient and packaging compatibility. You can make a pretty stable product that works well, but if it's not compatible with its packaging, then it's not going to be a good product. And the third would be the product and the skin surface or whatever application surface compatibility. There are, for example, color additives that are only approved for certain surfaces, so they will not be safe on other other surfaces, for example, ultramarines are in the United States approved for the face, but not the lips. Or henna is approved to color the hair, but not the skin. So these are things we need to take into account. And so when we combine ingredients, we need to know what is the optimal environment for an ingredient to work. You mentioned certain preservatives that only work below a certain pH. So we have to make sure that the ingredients and also the main ingredient in the product will also work and be stable at that pH. There are also thickeners that only work at certain pH ranges. So for example, if you're creating a product that has a low pH, like a glycolic acid product, and you're trying to thicken it with a thickener that only works around neutral pH, then obviously you're either not going to thicken the product or you're acid is not going to work anymore in the product. So chemists really need to consider everything that's going into the product and make sure that the ingredients will work well together in the given formulation. Now, a trend that I've seen on social media is people chasing after ingredients. They look for specific ingredients and they're like, oh yeah, this is going to work for me or this isn't going to work. So from this, why would you say that formulation matters more than the individual ingredients? Think of a product as a base and then decoration. So the base is made of your individual ingredients, which are the building blocks. And these building blocks interact in a product. They can either stay neutral and don't do anything to each other, but a lot of times they interact in a positive way. So we can use ingredients to boost the other ingredients performance. When it comes to sun protection, we can do that. When it comes to ingredient penetration, we can do that. But we can also sometimes experience negative effects between ingredients. So they don't work well together and they either separate out, they cause instability issues, they prevent ingredients from penetrating your skin or breaking down UV filters in the product. So it's really more than just the individual ingredient that is hard for consumers to know that it's, you can't just pick on an ingredient and decide how good the product is. It's really the entire formulation that needs to be looked at, which is really hard with a consumer eye, because for one, you can't really know what percentages of the ingredients go into the label for every single ingredient. And you don't know how the product was formulated. Formulation technology has a huge impact on how the product works and how stable it is. And now this might be redundant. You've already kind of brought up percentages. You don't know the percentage of ingredients that are going into formulas, but what if you did? Do percentages for ingredients tell us the effectiveness of products? What are your thoughts from a formulation point of view? No. And I hope that companies will stop labeling their products with percentages. I know it only happens for a few ingredients, mostly for bioactive ingredients, for anti-aging purposes. But 
for consumers, they should know that there are products that have a lower percentage of the same ingredient and could still outperform products that have a higher percentage of the same ingredients. Depends on what those building blocks in the product are and how well the product was designed and engineered to achieve what it needs to achieve. So percentages should not be really looked at because it's misleading. Consumers tend to believe that the higher the percentage, the better the product. It's not that simple. It's not a linear relationship. Now we're close to the 10 minute mark here. We will have a Q&A, but before that, do you have any takeaways that you'd want to leave our audience with? Yes. The biggest takeaway that I would say is to leave science to scientists. Science is, science is really hard to read and translate. So I would suggest that consumers listen to credible science communicators who have a science background, preferably those who have something to do with the cosmetic industry and have them explain to you what studies mean, how studies were designed by certain study designs are just not realistic. And that's why the results are not that reliable or translatable to real life situations. So just leave it to the scientists and and find your reliable sources. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this and for you guys in the audience. Now is the time for Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Backy, for that presentation. And we'll get right on to the Q&A. We've got a lot of questions. The first one is from Adria. Is a Master of Chemistry Sciences Sciences a good fit for becoming a cosmetic scientist and or formulator? Great question. Uh, so Master of Chemistry Sciences, it depends on what you learn in the school and if there are any formulation type of labs. Uh, chemistry is very important. There are multiple types of chemistries that play into formulating products, but the actual product formulation is a question if it is taught at that level or at that master's degree. So sometimes courses are not called the same way. I would look at the curriculum and the syllabus to see if there is any actual hands-on formulation part. But yes, that could be a great way to get into formulation. And there's also specific programs in cosmetic chemistry, too. So maybe you go look into there that. Are, lots of you can learn formulation um, at the undergraduate level as well. So it kind of depends on where you are in your career. The next question is from Melissa, who asks, why is an ingredient sometimes repeated, but in a different order in an ingredient list of a product? Great question. And I'd love to hear that you guys are reading ingredient labels. So on ingredient labels, usually the first ingredient you see is in the highest amount in the product. And as you go down, the percentage of the ingredients decrease up to a certain level, which we call the 1% level. Under 1%, there are rules that you can kind of mix up the order of ingredients, but there are still some specific rules that colors have to go to the end. So it just depends on how companies put together their product list. Sometimes one company finds that they need a higher amount of one ingredient than they, the other company needed. So it really just comes down to how the chemists were trying to formulate maybe the same product. They were trying to re, um, reverse engineer the product, which kind of means that you take an ingredient list and you try to figure out how the product was made and how much of each ingredient was used. And then you try to recreate that in the lab. So sometimes you just don't come out to the same percentage level of ingredients, but it is possible to formulate very similar products to each other. Sometimes the order is not exactly the same, but the products might feel somewhat or almost identical, um, could have very similar claims, could have very similar performance. The next question is from uh, Sarah, who asks, are expensive products really that much better? It seems like you can only vary the base so much and the rest would be sprinkles. <laughs> what a great mm -hmm. question. I have heard this question so many times. It depends. Um, so I would say a lot of times sprinkles or actually the actives that go into product. And when it comes to actives, I want to make sure the audience understands that in the United States, at least, cosmetic products cannot contain the regular drug active ingredients for like a salicylic acid uh, for acne purposes. Cosmetic actives, as a lot of raw ingredient suppliers call them, um, cosmetic actives are still cosmetic ingredients that will help you with brightening the skin or anti-aging claims. So for example, niacinamide, vitamin C are often referred to as cosmetic actives. A lot of times these are expensive ingredients, um, especially if they come in a more stabilized form, if they are more efficacious, if they are milder on the skin. So 
a lot of times more expensive products just are able to afford more of a high, um, I guess a newer version or a, or a more stabilized or milder version of the same ingredient. But I wouldn't say that a more expensive product is always better than a cheaper product. So it kind of comes down to what the company wanted to afford and what ingredients they wanted to use in the base. Um, it, it, a lot of times it depends on things consumers cannot read out of the product label because it comes down to how the product was put together in the first place by the chemists who were working on the product. Uh, this next question is from Tesla who asks, does the change in temperature uh, change or damage the product? And what temperature do you, you recommend to preserve the product? So maybe recommend for consumers. And is this applied to all skincare products? So I assume the question relates to not processing of the product because- Consumer storage, I would say. Consumer storage, yes. So yes, temperature has a huge influence on the viscosity of the product. So how thin or thick the product is and also product stability, emulsion. So your creams and lotions at home are made of oil and water that do not mix. We can keep them together with special types of ingredients. We call those emulsifiers but you challenge the stability of the product at high temperature. So if you accidentally leave your um, hand lotion or sunscreen in the car, you are challenging its stability. The higher the temperature, the quicker the product could possibly break. Although I have to say companies do stability testing on their products and expect some products to be left at higher temperatures. So for a short amount of time, it should be fine. But yes, temperature can change. It is in generally, uh, this rule applies to all products that are emulsion based. I would say those are the most um have the highest possibility to break and be unstable. Um, and what temperature, it depends on the preservative. Um, we typically recommend preservatives to be incorporated into the products below 40, 45 degrees Celsius, but there are preservatives that are stable even at higher temperatures. So I would check with the company that sold the ingredient itself, the preservative, to see what the processing parameters should be for that specific ingredient. Hard to make a general rule. Usually the lower the temperature, the better for adding preservatives, but there could be exceptions. And that's all the time we have for this Q&A. Five minutes really flies by. Thank you so much, Gabby. And we are on to the next presentation. Thank you. So this fireside chat is with Dr. Pushpa Rao. It's going to be a toxicology 101, a much needed topic here at the summit for all the noise that's on social media. And before we start talking about toxicology. Pushpa, would you mind introducing who you are and what you do? Yep. My name is Pushpa Rao, and I got my PhD in organic chemistry quite a while ago. I started in industry and regulatory affairs, and then kind of backed into toxicology. I studied for my boards in 2006, actually, because of my organic chemistry and the subject matter of my thesis. I didn't realize it, but toxicology was kind of a nice melding of two interests for me. I figured a good groundwork building question would be, what is toxicology? It's the study of potential toxic effects of different chemicals as they're exposed to living systems. And a foundational principle of toxicology is that the dose makes the poison. Anything can have an adverse effect depending on the amount of the exposure and, you know, how you're exposed. Are you ingesting it? Are you exposed to it through the skin or are you breathing it? Those different routes of exposure are important in determining whether an adverse event occurs or not. And so maybe just to say with that answer, anything can be a poison. It all depends on the dose. Right. And if you think of water, the normal amounts that are needed to sustain life are pretty generous. We all rely on water to exist, but large amounts of water, and depending on the you know the way you're exposed, obviously you can drown in water. Sometimes you don't even need a large amount of water in order to drown. So water normally is thought of as a life-giving chemical, right? We're all chemicals. Too much water can be detrimental. It really is about how much and how you're exposed. That is the study of toxicology in essence. And so you said how much, 
you talked about that quite a bit. And also how you're exposed, that this kind of gets into route of exposure. Maybe you can expand on that just a little as it applies to the dose response and things you have to think about. For cosmetics, the normal route of exposure is cosmetics we apply to the skin, whether it's the skin of the face, your hands, or all over the body, just your scalp. That's a different type of exposure and different types of metabolic pathways are open to that exposure versus if you ingest something, it goes down the esophagus into the GI tract that undergoes digestion and your body acts on it using different types of enzymes and stomach acid and may transform what you've ingested from something that's innocuous to something that may not be innocuous. And you have to think about what might happen when it's exposed to the digestive system versus when it's just sitting on the skin. There are different ways that the body can react to it depending on how we are exposed. And something that many of our viewers probably heard about is hazard versus risk. What's the difference? What's the difference between hazard versus risk? So hazard is something that's inherent to a chemical. When I say the word chemical, I mean, I know there's a lot of misinformation about chemicals are bad and things that are natural are good, but fundamentally everything is chemistry and water is a chemical. It's made up of different types of atoms. So there are different negative effects or hazards associated with a particular chemical. And depending on, as we talked about, the route of exposure, the amount, the frequency of the exposure, type of product that you know, you're exposed to, whether it's a rinse off or a leave on product, a different chemical might have the potential to cause an allergic reaction or may irritate the skin or could be a caustic where it would react aggressively with the skin. So all of those things are inherent to a specific chemical, whereas risk is the probability that that hazard will actually result in an adverse outcome. So even though something might have the potential to cause an allergic reaction, depending on the dose and how you're exposed, the risk may be low because how you interact with it. If it's just on your skin for a few minutes and you rinse it off, the potential that you're going to develop an allergic reaction with that exposure is very low versus if you keep it on your skin, don't rinse it off and put it on multiple times a day, then the probability that that you might develop an allergic reaction increases with that prolonged exposure. And I suppose building on the analogy that you used earlier with water. Well, the hazard of water is you can drown <laughs> or water poisoning. Okay. So if I'm going to drink a glass of water, how likely am I going to drown versus thimble of water in my lungs? Not so great. If I'm out in the ocean, there's a risk there. So yeah. that's a good way to kind of think about hazard versus risk. And now coming back to We've been talking about toxicology as a whole, kind of bringing in cosmetics. So this is more cosmetic specific. Right. How does the cosmetics industry ensure or try to ensure cosmetic ingredients in finished products are safe for consumers? Foundationally, we can think of what exactly is the purpose of a cosmetic. Cosmetic is intended to be applied to the skin. It's intended to promote cleanliness. It's to beautify, moisturize. So it's a topical type of exposure where it may be on your skin for 30 seconds, like a hand wash. You wash your hands and then you rinse it off. The purpose is to remove dust and dirt. Cosmetics are, by nature, they use less aggressive chemicals because you know the intended purpose is to cleanse, not to deconstruct or to change the character of the object that you're applying it to. Fundamentally, there's a presumption of safety and that's carried out in the ingredients that, that cosmetics use and also the use level. A cleansing agent, for example, 
if you use large percentages of it in your formula, it may be more irritating to the skin versus you formulate so that you have enough cleansing agent to clean, but not enough to cause an irritation. The formulations are designed to be as well tolerated as possible and be able to be used by a wide population of people. So they're designed to be safe and then also further tested to be safe. Right. We call it building safety in, and that's kind of the phrase I've been using for years. We choose the ingredients to meet certain criteria that they're largely not irritating at the use levels that they would be in a formulation. They are efficacious. So a moisturizing ingredient would help replenish moisture and keep moisture from being lost through the skin, where uh, sometimes that can happen because of changes in weather, you know, environmental factors. So we use cosmetics to compensate for those types of exposures where environment can cause your skin to feel dehydrated. You can combat that in multiple different ways. You can drink lots of water (laughs) and you can apply moisturizing creams and lotions to the skin. From your experience, what are some common misconceptions that you see about toxicology and cosmetics? I think when people hear the word toxicology, it can be frightening or intimidating because things that are toxic are inherently bad for you. And that's really not applicable to cosmetics. Although toxicologists are reviewing ingredients and making sure that the use levels are appropriate for the intended use of the product, toxicology is an avenue under which we conduct a risk assessment and take into account potential hazards of different ingredients and make sure that whatever hazards are inherent to an ingredient, the risk is mitigated. They would not be likely to cause an adverse effect given the type of product it is, the use level, the way it's applied to the body, you know, the residence time on the skin. All of those factors are taken into account. So the toxicologist is actually making sure that every ingredient in the formula is going to be well tolerated and not cause problems for the user. And that's all the time we have for the fireside part of this conversation. But now it's time for Q&A. So for you in the audience, if you have questions for Dr. Rao, now's the time. Thank you so much, Pushpa, for agreeing to this fireside Thank chat. You. Thank you so much for that informative presentation. And with that, we'll get Straight to the Q&A, and the first question was from Yelena, who asks, what are your thoughts on toxic UV filters like oxybenzone and octanoxate? Are they really that dangerous? So I, um, it's, it's been a while since I looked closely at the data on oxybenzone and octanoxate. Um, and I think for at least the octanoxate, we're talking more about environmental effects and potential effects on aquatic life and so on. Um, I think it's very, when we're, when we're talking about toxic effects, we have to keep in mind the uh, how the data was collected and whether or not we're talking about whole animal systems or we're talking about in vitro assays, which can give you directional information, but may not necessarily be predictive of real life effects. So um, a judicious amount of um, understanding that there's always uncertainty in data and keeping that in mind so that we're not thinking in categorical terms and absolute black and white type situations. Uh, this next question was from Miss Madcat. Are parabens okay or are they dangerous? I, I think poor parabens have suffered quite a bit from, I think it was back in the early 2000s when um, there was a paper published that found methylparaben in breast cancer tissue and that caused a lot of uproar and um There was um, a lot of angst, I understand, but parabens 
actually some of them occur in nature and they have been so well studied in terms of um, effects on humans. And especially if we're talking about cosmetic applications, um, they have been approved and are still used in pharmaceutical applications where people are ingesting and taking in the materials and they have not been banned, they're still used. And I think we have to kind of keep the hysteria down a little bit. And the fact that companies who have robust safety assessments and you know experts that are looking in the data and assessing what the risk is, um, they're still using it and because they're convinced of its safety. And I, my, I personally, this is my end of one, I believe they're safe as used and we shouldn't be vilifying them um, just to jump on a bandwagon for a completely different type of situation. Okay, since we are running a bit behind, I'll ask one more question, which is from Adria who asks, can we just trust in brands that they respect the limits of the ingredients to be secured? Or like, maybe they're asking like that we can trust brands to follow regulatory limits for ingredients and then also ensure their products are safe. It's been my experience that companies do pay attention to the regulatory restrictions and, you know, um, they do respect the uh, levels and they don't exceed it. And I can't think of a case where, um, to my knowledge, a, a, an ingredient was used at a higher than safe level in contravention of a regulation. So. And so that concludes our Q&A, five minutes goes by really quick. Uh, again, if you guys have more questions, feel free to put them in the comments and then we will try to cover this on our Instagram following the uh, following the summit. But thank you so much, Dr. Rao, for participating in our thank conference. You. And with that, it's our next presentation. I'm here with Dr. Ulrich Esberner and we are talking sunscreen. Before we get started, would you like to introduce yourself and what you do? Hi, my name is Ulrich Esberner. I work with personal care at BISF. I have been in the personal care industry since 26 years. My background is medicine. I'm a medical doctor. But during the last 26 years, I really worked mostly in chemistry and in cosmetic science. So why should we use sunscreen? Sun rays are potential harmful to human skin. And um, UVB rays, which are part of the sun rays, can cause skin cancer and sunburn, whereas UVA rays are responsible for photoaging and can also cause or are reason for malignant melanoma. Therefore, it is important to protect the skin against UV rays. The dermatologists recommend a holistic approach. They recommend to avoid the sun during midday hours, like between 11 o'clock and 2 o'clock. They also recommend appropriate clothing and they recommend sunscreens, which can protect your skin when you apply it frequently during the day when you are in the sun. I have one thing to add. It is important also to not just use sunscreens during vacation or holidays. It is also important to use sunscreens during every day's life when you are in the sun. Maybe not for like a couple of minutes, but when you are in the sun for a little bit longer time, whether it's for leisure like jogging or other activities, or when you are in the sun for working purposes. This is especially important when you are you have children or when you are children. So even children which are in the sun during the day need to be protected by sunscreen. What is the yeah. difference between organic and inorganic sunscreen? Both organic and inorganic sunscreens are made by chemical synthesis. Organic uh, sunscreens are made by, by carbon chemistry. Inorganic sunscreens are made by synthesis of metal ions, normally with oxygen, like 
to achieve at the end zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. Both are made by chemical processes. The mechanism of action is also very similar. Both work mainly with absorption. It's also true for chemical or for organic and inorganic UV filters. You have also scattering and reflection properties. So there's a lot of rumors online about how sunscreens aren't safe. Is that true? And what do we know about the safety of sunscreens? Sunscreens are regulated by authorities. On one hand, um, you have the finished product, which are regulated, but also the ingredients. When we start at the ingredient level, only ingredients which went through a very time-consuming approval process can be used in sunscreens. And in Europe, as well as in other regions, you have a list of approved ingredients which can be used in sunscreens and are approved by the authorities. In addition, the sunscreen producer has to make sure that the claims are proven and measured in different tests. In principle and normally, the sunscreen producers use in vivo tests to measure the SPF. However, depending on the claims they have, whether it's a UVA claim, but also claims on sensory or additional uh, claims have to be proven as well. In general, sunscreens which are commercially available, very safe. What are some common misconceptions that turn up when we talk about sunscreens? Yeah, one misconception is that a small amount of sunscreen is enough to achieve the desired sun protection factor. The measured amount for the SPF is around 2 milligrams per 25 square centimeters, which sounds very little, but at the end, it's 40, it can be up to 40 to 50 milliliters per, per full skin area. So if you are at the beach at one point of time, uh, you really need to use uh, 40 milliliters to get the desired SPF. And sometimes, depending on your activities, whether you go swimming or are at the beach a lot, play volleyball, you need to reapply. This can mean that during the day you need 50, 60, up to 100 milliliters. And sometimes this is half a bottle. So this is one misconception. In general, uh, not enough sunscreen is applied to get the desired SPF. Can you actually work out the SPF level from the percentages of filters used in a sunscreen? This is complicated. However, it is possible. We developed a simulator tool. It's called Sunscreen Simulator, which can, based on a certain algorithm and on the absorption profiles of the chosen UV filters, predict the SPF of a certain of a combination of UV filters at certain percentages. On the other hand, the formulator also needs the full formulation with emulsifiers and emollients and with this full formulation at the end you can only really measure the in vivo. So with the in vitro tool you can give a good prediction but at the end you have to measure it with in vivo measurement. There's also a lot of rumors online about how sunscreens might be bad for the environment. Can you tell us a bit more about that? As mentioned before, the ingredients which are used in sunscreens, especially the UV filters, are tested in sequence of toxicological tests. And these includes also aquatic uh, toxicity. Most of the UV filters which are in use have a very, very low toxicological profile and in general are safe for the environment. We developed a tool which can even be used to combine the best ingredients and best UV filters, it's called the EcoSun Path tool to enable the formulators to develop the least environmentally harmful sunscreen. Thank you so much for sharing all this information about sunscreens with us. Are there any final takeaways you'd like to leave us with? Yeah, the final takeaways are, as I said at the beginning, please use sunscreen when you are at the sun. It is important and finally will protect and uh, prevent you from uh, getting not just, not just wrinkles in your skin, but also skin cancer. Um, you, you will look much healthier. And uh, at the end, also, please look for your relatives and friends to use 
uh, sunscreen when in the sun. Thank you so much. And now for everyone in the audience, it's time for the Q&A. Thank you so much for that informative presentation. And like the rest of the Q&As, we'll get straight to it. The first question was from Andrea, who asks, what are your thoughts on inhalation toxic effects of zinc oxide? Uh, we've heard titanium dioxide is questioned, but not that much about zinc oxide. What's going on there? Yeah, both uh, are inorganic uh, UV filters, which are um, also, as, as all UV filters, um, tested regularly. And um, the inhalative toxicity is also a point which is uh, important here in case um, there is a problem with inhalative toxicity of any UV filters. There are some limitations depending on the on the regions where the products are used. Uh, for example, there might be some restrictions on um, sun sprays. However, when it comes to regular uh, UV um, sunscreen lotions or creams, uh, this should not be a problem. Uh, the next question was from Ta. Uh, I'm okay with most sunscreen products, but oftentimes they sting my eyes. What UV filters should I avoid? And also maybe I'll pack on. What's going on with eye sting in sunscreen products? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, actually. It happens actually to me also very often when I'm doing bicycling or something like this. Um, well, first of all, it's important to apply the sunscreens really properly and uh, not to to put them close close to your eyes. That, that's very important. Also, um, I, I wouldn't say there is one UV filter which causes more eye stinging or more irritation than the others. It also depends on the other parts of the formulations of the emollients, which can also um, spread into the eyes. So in general, I would recommend to use um, more dry sunscreens uh, like gels or something which has, is not so oily to avoid this uh, stinging into your eyes. This next question is from Nina Hedge. I'm sorry, I've probably mispronounced this. Do you need to use sunscreen when you're inside your own home? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Do you need to wear sunscreen when you're at home, inside? No, you don't need to wear sunscreens at home. Not at all. Uh, and this next question is from Jacqueline. How safe are lip products with, with SPF since they are inevitably ingested? Yeah, I know their, their lip products also contain um, sunscreens. And um, of course, you ingest uh, small amounts, little little amounts. But these amounts are so uh, small that there is no danger for your for your health. Uh, this next, oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this next question is from Wendy, who asks: Are mineral sunscreens better than chemical sunscreens? Yeah, well, there's a, I know there is a discussion ongoing, and um, um, in principle, both types of sunscreens have been tested. And both sunscreens, type of sunscreens or UV filters, if um, formulated properly and um, applied uh, on the skin, um, have a, a very good safety profile. So I, I would say, I would answer this question with a no. Uh, they're not better nor worse. And it really depends on the, on the application and formulation you use. Um, also, the organic sunscreens, uh, especially the, the modern UV filters, are very safe. This next question is from Tessa, who asks, I've understood the UV index mainly reflects UVB. How much does UVA correlate with the UVI? Where I live, the UVI stays at zero for four months in the winter. Is there still enough UVA to warrant using SPF? It's a, it's a, it's a really good question. So I have not, not thought about it yet. But in principle, it's a, the correlation. If, if there is a high UV index, then it should um, apply for both UVB and UVA. So um, they have the similar proportion in general, unless you have some, some filtering uh, circumstances. Um, but in principle, the um, amount should be the same. So if there is a very high UV index of 8 or 9 or 10, then it applies for both UVB and UVA. Uh, this next question is from uh, Beijum. I'm probably mispronounced that, but what do you think about the usage of new generation chemical filters, sunscreens during pregnancy? And maybe I'll just say like 
uh, there's a lot of controversy for chemical filters uh, during pregnancy. Thoughts? Um, well, first of all, um, I would not stop uh, using sunscreens when in the sun and especially when you're pregnant. Sun is also good for you, for your mood. And um, of course, maybe you should not go in the sun in, in summer vacation on the beach uh, for, for every day and, and really try to get a, get a very uh, deep tan. Um, yeah, in, in principle, I would not stop using them. Um, there are controversies on um, some endocrine effects on, um, on UV filters. Um, these discussions are ongoing. There are some UV filters which are concerned. Nevertheless, I would not stop using them, um, even if I would be, well, I cannot be, but even in pregnancy. And that concludes our last question for the Q&A. Five minutes flies by. Thank you so much Thank for participating in our summit. And with that, we move on to our next presentation. Thank you. Bye-bye. This presentation is going to be a nitty gritty into the weeds talk about Inky. There's a lot going on and who better to join me than Dr. Mindy Goldstein, who is a, I would say, one of my chemist idols in cosmetics. Maybe I'll leave the introduction to you, Mindy. Would you mind introducing who you are and what you do? Thanks, Jen. Dr. Mindy Goldstein. I have a PhD in the basic medical sciences from NYU. I have been in the personal care cosmetic area for over 30 years. I have worked both on the raw material side and on the finished goods side, mostly in the bioactive space. I also have been involved in the PCPC Inky Committee for almost 27, 28 years, something like that. I hit up the biotech, botanical, and fermentation group. So all the names that are given in that area usually come through the group that I work with. I'm very active in the industry. I've been president of the National Society twice. I've been editor of the journal for the National Society twice. Still very active in a number of ways, and I'm an advisor to CNT Magazine. And for the influencers who don't know, CMT is Cosmetics and Toiletries. It's a really great trade magazine. And for the National Society, we're talking about the Society of Cosmetic Chemists, also a great uh, association for professionals working in cosmetic sciences in North America. And so I figure it makes sense to start with some groundwork building questions. First, what does Inky mean and what goes into that? So INCI, I-N-C-I, stands for International Nomenclature of Cosmetic Ingredients. INCI names are uniform. They're systematic names internationally recognized to identify cosmetic ingredients. The INCI has a committee made up of 20, 25 members that are split into three major areas of expertise. Chemistry, including organic and inorganic, polymers and silicones, and biotech, botanical, and fermentation. The committee meets about five times per year to review applications for names. The committee that assigns the names consists of approximately 20 cosmetic industry experts representing finished product manufacturers and ingredient suppliers from council members, that's the Personal Care Product Council that runs this. So council member companies, industry experts, and scientists from academia, plus U.S. agencies that deal with the industry, such as the FDA and the CIR, which is the Cosmetic Ingredient Review, and U.S. Adopted Names Council. We also have international members, International Cosmetic Trade Association representatives, and international government liaisons, for instance, from Canada, Europe, Japan, and Colombia. There's this big book of inky names. I don't know if you want to <laughs> talk That's about that. The dictionary. So the dictionary well, they used to be published. They are now only available online through Personal Care Product Council. The dictionary contains all of the names that have been assigned and typically the trade names that fall under those inky names, as well as a definition of what that inky is. Many trade names are listed under one ingredient because multiple companies may actually supply that ingredient. And I feel like this leads me well to the next question, which is why can many ingredients 
fall into one inky? Or maybe why can one inky represent so many different ingredients? You see a lot of that type of thing where the inky name is not specific. It's really generalized. So, I mean, the explanation is a bit complicated. Let's take the plant area because that's where you find a lot of this. And and there's a warning in that. Many names are based on the raw material source, especially for plant-derived ingredients. In the case of botanical-based ingredients, if a specific compound of interest is not purified to over 80%, then the name would be the genus and species of the plant, followed by the plant part and the word extract usually, such as camella sinensis leaf extract. That happens to be a tea extract. And it doesn't matter whether it's green tea or black tea, it's the genus and species. Vitus vinifera, which is grape extract, or Glyceriza galabra, which is licorice root extract. Licorice is Glyceriza galabra. So those plant parts have many compounds that can be found when you start to extract them. If the company is not focused on one compound in particular, or doesn't purify that one key compound to 80% or greater, it gets this generalized genus species plant extract name. So you can have a lot of companies that are making licorice extracts and they don't have a specialized compound name like glycerotinic acid, which is one of the main compounds for anti-inflammatory that's found in licorice roots. Even though it may be in each of those extracts, it may not exist to the same percentage in each of those extracts. It's really dependent on what the manufacturer is doing and how they prepare their extract. I mean, they may be extracting it with water. Some may be supercritical CO2 extraction or even oil extract. And you'll get different compounds out of that extract, out of that plant part, depending upon what you extract it with. It's still licorice extract. It's not really the same. And hence, the biological activity may not be the same for every licorice extract. And that's the word of caution. When you're looking at these things, you really have to know what biological activity they have and what supplier it's being purchased from. So that's why you'll find multiple trade names under the same name, because it still falls into the same inky name, but they, they're not exactly the same necessarily. In an example, I always like to give people just because there's so many misconceptions around silicones, like this product had dimethicone and it was too heavy for me. And therefore I don't like dimethicone. Well, firstly, like, is it the dimethicone actually causing that issue in the formula? Like formula is more, more than the sum of its parts, but also dimethicone on a label can represent a lot of different right. <laughs> molecular okay. weights with lots of different right. feels and performances and so on and so exactly. forth. Exactly. So it's a general area. Dimethicone is a general name and doesn't really drill down to the weight of the dimethicone or anything else. With this in mind, how would you suggest the everyday consumer read an ingredient list? Ingredient lists are pretty complex for the everyday consumer, but Let's start with the history of it. In 1967, the FDA passed the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act, which people call FPLA, which mandated that ingredients have to be written by the name established by an authoritative reference. The FDA guidelines recognizes Inky as the authoritative reference containing proper nomenclature for the purposes of ingredient labeling. For cosmetics, the international nomenclature of cosmetic ingredients is the only acceptable option for ingredient listings. Every ingredient that is present in the product should be listed on the ingredient list. On a product label, the ingredients are listed in an order of predominance, with the ingredients used in the greatest amount based on weight first, followed in descending order by those in smaller amounts until you hit 1%. Ingredients present in amounts lower than 1% can be listed in any order. The exception to this is that colors and pH adjusters are typically listed at the end of the list. What an ingredient list doesn't tell you is how the ingredients are mixed together. If you've ever followed a recipe, then you know that there is more to a formula than just mixing the ingredients together. The outcome is dependent on many factors like order of addition and the temperature that it's processed at. These factors can change the final product in many ways 
And two products may contain mostly the same ingredients and yet be very different. And so maybe a good analogy could be like a cake. You put in the same ingredients. Now I do it and you do it, cook it, mix it differently. We're going to have two very different cakes. Exactly. (laughs) And my final question is, are there any takeaways that you'd want to leave our audience with? So Inky names are systematic names that are internationally recognized. It's one recognizable name for each ingredient harmonized for global trade and distribution. If you understand the ingredient labeling rules and regulations and you know typical use levels for the ingredients listed, then you can approximate the quantitative breakdown of that formula. That said, the ingredient list will not tell you how to make the formula, obviously. And the actual percentages are never listed in the label. The only time you'll find an actual percentage is for an OTC, such as sunscreen or acne products. That falls into an over-the-counter drug. The FDA has specific guidelines on how you have to label those products. And the active ingredients have to be labeled with exact percentages. And then all the other ingredients follow the same laws that a cosmetic product does, especially if they're making any cosmetic claims on the OTC drug. As you can imagine, this is a really complicated topic. There's a lot more to it. We're just brushing the surface. (laughs) Stay tuned. If you have questions for Mindy, think about them now and you can ask them in the live Q&A. Thank you so much, Mindy, for agreeing to participate. Well, that was such an informative presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldstein. And we'll get straight to the first question from Joel Gulcha, who asks, why are some key ingredients mentioned on the top of the box yet not mentioned in the ingredient list in the back? And I think this is like, for example, vitamin B3 on the top and niacinamide in the back. What do you think? So if you're talking about the ingredient list, uh, sometimes companies use a common name for an ingredient when they talk about their romance copy on the box because the consumer will recognize vitamin B as opposed to niacinamide. And niacinamide is the given inky name for that component. So that's what appears in the ingredient list. Now, obviously um, OTCs are different. Uh, So for a pure cosmetic, the ingredient list is one simple box, a list of all the ingredients, as I said, starting with the highest concentration, going down to the least with some changes in that. Um, And I went over what the caveats are. Uh, But um, uh, in an OTC, the top of it has to meet the FDA labeling requirements. So active ingredients such as sunscreens or um, acne components have to be listed at the top as active ingredients with their percentage. And then everything else is listed in the other ingredients. Uh, This next question comes from uh, Neimani, who asks, should we listen to those websites that rate ingredients as good or bad? Okay, so um, there there's some uh, bad suggestions in them, and there are some good suggestions in them. So the EWG, which is probably the most popular, the Environmental Working Group is probably the most popular uh, site for looking at good and bad. Um, The science is not always great. And so they make decisions based on some science that may be what we like to refer to as junk science. Uh, So you have to be careful. You know, what you read on the web is not always true. You really should talk to someone who is in the industry to find out what's real and what's not. Uh, This next question is from uh, Sarah, who asks, How are product labels regulated so that consumers know they are accurate as to what's actually in the product? So ingredient lists are not regulated. Obviously, there's a law on how you're supposed to label a cosmetic. Um, That's in the uh, Federal Register and um, can be found on the FDA website. But um, you have to rely on the company that they're telling you the truth. And unfortunately, there's nobody overseeing that. That may change somewhat with new regulation that's coming out, which is MOCRA, as we refer to it, 
where products are going to have to be registered with the FDA and every ingredient in it is going to have to be registered. So um, prior to this time, it was a voluntary registration for a cosmetic with the FDA, but now it'll be mandatory. Okay, so one more question from Hadra Banks. You asked, is there any way we can know that the quality of ingredients, for example, ginseng, uh, do we just have to trust in the brands? Is there any protection of quality on such ingredients to be able to put it on the list? Unfortunately, quality does not go into ingredient naming. Um, ingredient names, as I mentioned in my uh, talk before, are given by the uh, Inky Committee, um, which is part of the Personal Care Product Council. And those ingredient names are based on what the ingredient is and how it's made and not on the quality of the ingredient. You're gonna to have to trust the company that's putting out the product, that they looked at the quality of the product and the safety of each ingredient that goes into their product. And that's all the time we have for this Q&A. Thank you so much, Mindy, for agreeing to give this presentation and participating in the Q&A. And with that, we move on to our next presentation. Thank you, Jen. Bye-bye. This presentation is with Dr. Simone Swafford, and we're going to be getting into the weeds about regulation. So this is your 101 regulatory presentation. Thank you so much, Simone, for agreeing to do this. And maybe before I start asking you questions about regulations, would you mind quickly introducing who you are and what you do? I'm Simone. I'm the CEO and founder of Vogue Regulatory. I spent almost 17 years in the beauty industry, personal care, consumer health care, a little bit of food some dietary supplements too as well, but I always say beauty is my first love. So I'm really happy to be here today talking to you. And so on that note, my first question to you on regulations <laughs> for groundwork, what is a cosmetic versus what is a drug? Both cosmetics and drugs are defined by by their intended use. Ironically, the law doesn't say you have to be formulated. It doesn't say it has to be tested, though it should, but it's defined by their intended use. So cosmetics really are products, articles, the law says, that you apply to the human body for the purposes of beautifying, cleansing, promoting attractiveness, right? In contrast, drugs are products that are intended to diagnose, cure, treat, or prevent a disease, or products that are intended to affect the structure or function of the body. You have cosmetics, which really affect from an appearance perspective, and then you have drugs that affect from a structure function perspective. And then with that background, yes. how are cosmetics regulated? By law, <laughs> as everything in the United States, whether or not people may like to think that. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, regulates cosmetics under two particular laws. The Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, or the FDNC Act, which really defines certain definitions that are important to cosmetics, misbranded, interstate commerce, adulterated. And then you also have the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act, which is really supposed to help consumers make informed purchasing decisions. So cosmetics are regulated really under those two particular laws. Now you've alluded to this already. I'm going to lump two questions together. Sure. How are claims regulated versus how is safety regulated? Under law, under the Federal Trade Commission Act, advertising must be truthful and not misleading. So you can't position your product in a way that you know is untruthful or misleading. And it can't be unfair. So you really shouldn't be making claims or assertions, not just about your products that better position themselves compared to others if it's really not truthful and you don't have the data to back that up. Safety in itself is a claim. Right. Safety and effectiveness are both claims pertaining to cosmetic products. And again, under law, your product must be substantiated safety wise. Right. So it is up to the, the individual or companies who manufacture a product to have adequate substantiation that their products are safe for use. There has been a little bit of a change in the law. I don't want to say with respect to that, but with respect to FDA's response to products that have, have been deemed to be unsafe or adulterated, 
when you talk about an adulterated product, it's a product that really contains something or is manufactured in a way that would make it harmful or injurious to consumers. So let's say the FDA, either through adverse event reporting or just becoming aware through you know, consumer reports that a product has been found to be unsafe in the past, the FDA sort of had to work with manufacturers or, or, or cosmetic companies to have them voluntarily remove those products from the market. Now under MOCRA, which you have to be living under a rock if you haven't heard about MOCRA, right? Which is the Modernization of Cosmetics Regulation Act. Now under MOCRA, FDA has mandatory recall authority. So if the FDA tries to work with a manufacturer to voluntarily recall their product from, a, from the market, if it's been found to be adulterated and there's concern for serious adverse events for consumers, if that manufacturer, I believe, doesn't recall that product within 10 days, the FDA can mandatorily recall it from the market. Cosmetics products have a relatively long history of safe use in the United States. I think not only from a, a regulatory perspective that companies really try to make sure they have adequate substantiation of safety, legally it protects them too as well, right? Who wants to be sued for products that are causing harm to consumers? So I think that's something that consumers also need to keep in mind. What are some common claims or maybe huh. <laughs> they maybe they're not common. But what are some claims that are not permitted on cosmetics? You know, earlier I talked about the distinction between a cosmetic and a drug, right? And so claims that go beyond appearance into either treating or preventing disease or affecting the structure or function of the body, those types of claims are not permitted on cosmetic products. In the past, we've seen the FDA take regulatory action against cosmetic products claiming either to treat acne, eczema, inflammation, making antibacterial claims, just to name a few. Some of the more cosmetic type claims that really do fall into drug realm, wrinkle reduction, boosting collagen or stimulating collagen, Lightening skin are also examples of claims that have gotten companies in trouble in the past from the FDA. Really finally claims that a cosmetic product can provide similar, equal, or better results than medical or aesthetic treatments. Those are always a no-no. Yeah, so like targeting or treating, should I say, acne, melasma, yes. what we're talking about here. Yes. <laughs> All of the above. And there are ways to cosmetically qualify those. So instead of skin lightening, you want to say brighten skin, right? Instead of wrinkle reduction, improves the appearance of wrinkles, softens the look, visibly reduces the look of. All of these things are, are suitable alternatives. And as I'm talking, one of the other ones that came to mind, I think a lot of people tend to focus on skin and not necessarily think about hair. But Claims to regrow hair are also not cosmetic claims and are not permitted. So you can say, for example, you may have an eyelash treatment or a hair treatment that it can make the hair look fuller or thicker, but it cannot regrow hair or it cannot actually make hair thicker and fuller. It can only do that from an appearance perspective. Uh, what are some repercussions of non-compliance? And so when you think about what noncompliance gets you, it gets you the attention of the, either the FDA and or the FTC. And that really is the beginning of a very long-term complicated relationship that I think companies at all levels should try to avoid. So you have the FDA, uh, which really regulates labeling, and then you have the Federal Trade Commission, which is the FTC, that regulates advertising. The FDA, when they see labeling claims, and they tend to do this even from companies' websites because websites are considered an extension of your labeling. As a first line of enforcement action, FDA typically issues a warning letter. And you may say, hey, it's just a warning letter. It's to be ignored. Typically, companies, I think, have about 15 days to respond to those. And if they don't respond or in a manner that is not acceptable to the agency, it can rise to the level of legal action. So you also now have the FTC, which, which has a, a different yet similar process. And the FTC can actually issue consent orders, which companies typically have to abide by for years. 
And then there's also the monetary penalties that are attached to that. What we've noticed within the last few years, Jen, that I find really interesting is when companies tend to get in trouble from a, a regulatory perspective, what we like to call the plaintiff's bar is also paying attention. And I'll, I'll give you an example. So if you have company A that makes an anti-wrinkle product and they say their product removes wrinkles, it, it's comparable to actually getting laser treatments on your face, you look 10 years younger. And let's say this company gets a warning letter from the FDA. What we found happening is not too long after that, they may get a, a lawsuit from a, a plaintiff's lawyer alleging deception on the, on the part of their client stating, hey, my client would not have bought this product and paid a premium price for it if, it, if they had known your, your claims were untrue. Therefore, they were deceived and they need to receive damages uh, as a result of that deception. So you're looking at from a non-compliance standpoint, there is always a possibility of regulatory enforcement action and then subsequently following that, there's also the possibility of legal action in the terms of uh, lawsuits. And so we will end the presentation here and leave the rest because 10 minutes is really hard for a presentation with so much information. This yeah. presentation could go on for hours, <laughs> days maybe. It so could. if you guys have any questions, Now's your time to ask Simone questions, and we will be right back with a live Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Swafford, for that informative presentation, and we'll get straight to the Q&A. The first question came from Tessa, who asked, are regulations different for when a brand makes a claim about their product versus when a retailer makes a claim about the product? That's a very good question. And, and to which I will respond, that's the beautiful thing about regulations is that it equalizes the playing field, right? It's supposed to do that. So there isn't one standard for brands. There isn't one standard for retailers. There isn't one standard for anybody else. Everybody is supposed to abide by the same rules. So if it seems like a retailer or a brand is making more excessive claims versus one or the other, um, that's, that's not permitted unless, unless that retailer or that brand may have the substantiation in-house that they feel necessary or, or they feel comfortable that can help them to support that claim. Does that answer the question? Does that make sense? I think so. Uh, and this next question I thought was really good. Uh, do you think the FDA and FTC are doing enough to enforce regulations? So I'm going to couch this by saying that this is my opinion, um, but the data um, in terms of enforcement action would seem to support that. But in terms of FDA, I think there's the opportunity to do more. I tend to look at warning letters from the agency, and when you go back to their website, the last few warning letters that they've made for cosmetic companies um, making drug claims for products that are marketed as cosmetics go quite, maybe I want to say 2018, 2017, I could be wrong. Um, but if you think about it, over the last few years, we've had COVID, the agency has had other priorities, and now we have MOCRA, right? So the agency is working on other important activities. That being the case, it would seem from an FDA standpoint that there hasn't been a lot of enforcement activity in this space. And, and I think with that, there's the opportunity to do more. Um, I am hopeful that we will see that activity pick up, um, especially when the requirements of MOCRA come into play. Even though labeling is not required as part of the, the product listing submissions, you may find companies may submit labels to the agency. And so as they see what companies are saying and on their products, they, they might feel a little bit more compelled to act. In terms of FTC, I think the FTC tends to be busy. I see a broad range of action from FTC across different industries. Um, you could see more also within the beauty space. Um, so in some ways, I, I do agree that there's opportunity for both agencies to do more. You might see that pick up. The, you know, the FTC has also had other priorities, one of which is the green guides, right? They've been working on updating that. And the last update to that 
was, I think, 2012, and that's no small task. There's a lot of information that goes in that, um, especially as it means to help industry navigate uh, in terms of, you know, environmental regulation. So, so I, I'm hopeful that we might see more activity from both agencies as 2024 rolls around. That's 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 my hope and my prayer. <laughs> Uh, this might be the last question. So this is from Mercedes. I thought it was really good. Is there somewhat of a loophole where brands can make the claim for, say, X ingredient in a product boost collagen? Sometimes you see this on, say, their website versus um, making the claim on their product or like this product boosts collagen versus this ingredient boosts collagen. So I'll answer that question in, in two parts. So Boosting collagen is not a permitted claim on a cosmetic product. And we've actually seen the FDA issue warning letters in the past for companies purporting or marketing their cosmetic products to increase collagen because it's it's considered a structure function of a type of claim. What you're basically or in essence saying is that you're affecting the structure or function of the human body, which is a drug claim. So number one, whether it's an ingredient or the product formulation in its Society, neither one is allowed to say, you know, that it boosts collagen. The second part to that, I think, boils down to the risk appetite of the business, right? So you may find, and this is, it's not a loophole. I think this is, these are companies that are paying attention. You find that they may be less risk averse on their website because what we found over the last few years is FDA will issue warning letters based on what companies say on their website because it's easy picking, it's low hanging fruit. They don't have to leave their office. They can just search the web and they consider um, your website an extension of your product labeling. So a company might decide, hey, you know, we'll be willing to make this claim on packaging because the likelihood of somebody seeing this in a store among so many other products, it's lower versus on a website where it's it's easily more attainable or accessible on the World Wide Web. So it, it's just, I think it just depends on the company. You might even find it flipped where a company might say, okay, we don't want to put it on packaging because if we have to re remove it, the cost associated with removing it, it's not something that we're willing to bear. We'll, we'll, we'll say it on the website because with the website, even if we get in trouble, hey, we can always take it down. We can always change the website relatively easy. There's more involved when you have to change product packaging. And that's all the time we have for this Q&A. Thank you so much, Simone. I will give a quick plug for her social media. If you guys have more regulatory questions, yes, we will post more answers on our feed at Beauty Sci-Com, but you can also go follow her directly on her feed on Instagram, Vogue.Regulatory. Go find her and you can ask her all the questions you want there. Thank you so much, Simone. And with that, we move on to our next presentation. Bye. Thank you for having me. Preservatives are a vital part of most cosmetic products, but they're often unfairly demonized on social media. It's gotten to the point where people are purposely avoiding them because they think they're bad for their health, but this is a really bad idea from a scientific point of view. So we're talking to Isil Chowcap of Clarion today. Clarion are an ingredient supplier who supply lots of ingredients, including preservatives. We're going to be covering preservatives and preservation in our products, whether it's skincare, hair care, shower gels, makeup, any of the many products that we might use every day. But before we start, can you tell us a bit about yourself and what you do? Hi, uh, my name is Aysel Chalkov. Uh, I'm a microbiologist. I've been working as a microbiologist over 20 years and especially with the preservatives. So I love working with preservative microbiologists and preservative as a such a fantastic relationship. One ingredient category that we don't really talk about and appreciate enough, in my opinion, is preservatives. Can you tell us a little bit about what preservatives are and why they're so important in our products? Preservatives are necessary ingredients for consumer products intended to inhibit the development of microorganisms in cosmetic products. Preservatives are critical ingredients in the keeping the product clean, crisp, and component. Microorganisms can grow in almost every substance when they find the right environment and can often attack even 
decompose the product. So aqueous cosmetics are excellent environment for the bacteria, yeast, and fungus growth. So if you do not have the right preservation system, you may have some visible growth, your product color may change, you can feel the unpleasant odor, and product texture even change. So those bring consequences such as product recall, severe health risk, and financial risk. And we don't want that. I think a lot of us have seen on social media and in online reviews some of those issues with underpreserved products. Some of us might have even experienced it ourselves. When there's a product and it's got like fuzzy spots growing on it and it hasn't been expired and you haven't kept it in weird conditions like too hot or too cold, that is probably going to be a product that doesn't have a suitable preservative system. There are some products that are self-preserving. Like you said, it's usually aqueous or really water-heavy products that have a high microbial risk. So those might not need preservatives, but there are other products on the market that don't have these features, but they still claim to be so-called preservative-free, but they aren't really going moldy or anything. How does that work? The term preservative-free means without preservative as an ingredient. So the risk of making the product preservative-free in those cases would be the product susceptible to microbial contamination, which is unacceptable. There are different kinds of preservatives. Europe and Japan are regulated positive list of preservatives, such as aromatic alcohols like phenexaethanol, benzyl alcohol, organic acid like sorbic acid, benzoic acid, paraben, organohalogen, isotizolin, these are all different preservatives. So the industry is losing many of this preservative due to negative press, regulatory pressure. Almost every preservative is under public discussion. Formulators are looking for alternative preservation like new system like multifunctional ingredients as a booster. So there are multifunctional booster are not listed as a preservative, but they are ingredients are like antioxidant, key leading agent, pH. So this can also contribute to preservation system. One of the critical factor also is the good manufacturing practices, which is also part of the preservation system. So the finished product must be stabilized against the microbial growth. This is a preservation, like preservation and preservative terminology needs to be understood by consumer. Cosmetic products should not damage human health. Therefore, we must ensure the products are preserved. Annex 5 in Europe and Japan regulates the positive list of the preservative. So consumer needs to know the meaning of the preservative free. Preservative free does not mean that the product is not preserved. Still the product is preserved differently, just not with preservative as an ingredient. It only uses different ingredients instead of preservative component, like multifunctional are used instead. There's one really big misconception that I see a lot on social media from consumers and clean beauty brands, but also from a lot of scientists and medical doctors, the idea that preservatives aren't safe. They are often the ingredients that those clean beauty product scanning apps are picking out and saying that they're really harmful for our health. They'll say things like there's cancer or fertility issues, stuff like that. Can you tell us a bit about how ingredient suppliers go about ensuring that preservatives in cosmetics are safe? Because obviously if they weren't, then you might be sued. So when microbiologists develops the preservative system for cosmetic products, they confront several challenges like stable for the products, life efficacious, cost effective, acceptable from the regulatory review and safe for customer and safety consideration this is very important when you create the preservation system. Safety consideration requires toxicology testing, skin toxicity testing, so irritant testing and skin sensitization testing. So based on this result is acceptable use level can be recommended. So this is all based on those principles of toxicology, the dose makes the poison and so on. Toxicology is another aspect of cosmetics that isn't really that well understood by the general public and it is covered in another beauty science count talk that you can check out if you haven't already. 
Thank you so much for taking us on a bit of an introductory tour of preservatives today. Do you have any takeaways about preservatives that you'd like to leave us with? Sure. It's the topic of preservation is always important for the formulators. And formulators know the necessity of the preservative of their products to ensure the product safety and care for customers. So products are legally demanded. A cosmetic product should not damage the human health. Claims like free of preservative are achievable. Uh, most of the multifunctional boosters are limited to spectrum activity. The finished product must be stabilized against the microbial growth. That's the only last word I can say. Thank you so much for all that information. For our audience, if you have any questions about preservatives and preservation that you really want to ask, this is your chance because we have a bit of time now for a Q&A session. And thank you so much, Aisel, for that informative presentation. And we'll get straight to the Q&A. The first question is from Beck. This might be a hard answer to give for all preservatives out there, but I'll ask it anyways. What exactly are preservatives and the chemistry behind them? So maybe you can talk about the chemistry behind many preservatives and then yeah. how are they made in like many preservatives? <laughs> so how are they made? Oh. What do they do? What's the chemistry behind them? I mean, a preservative, as I said, they are the necessary ingredients to inhibit the microbial growth. So how we make them? So we uh, first you have to understand the chemistry. What is the, um, you know, um, in what class is the chemistry? Then after that, you basically run the MIC testing, minimal inhibitory te concentration testing, to understand against the several uh, bacteria and fungus, and if. if has any microbial efficacy and you can choose your um, bacteria and fungus after the testing. So then you start making your product. And so it's a very, you know, I don't know how to explain that to you to uh, like, you know, <laughs> Jen said, it's a very it's a broad question. But the, basically the first step is that you do the your MIC testing to understand the efficacy point, then you start making the product. Um, would you mind expanding what exactly happens during challenge testing for finished products? Why do we do that and what goes into it? Oh, is the that is the, the it's a, it's an excellent question actually. P without the PT testing, you know, um, putting the product out there is absolutely no, no. So PET testing is hard of to choose in the preservative. So when you do PET testing, you don't only do one preservative and, and levels also. Um, that is the key testing you should do before you put the, your product out there. So it just... Um, tells you is the choosing the whatever preservative you chose is working or not. So it is the key testing. Uh, this next question is from Tessa who asked, is it really beneficial to use a spoon or a spatula to take out product from a jar instead of just dipping your fingers in it? Is that protective to the formula? Uh, it just, you know, is another good question. It just helps, but is uh, answering your question. If you preserve well your product, so you put in your fingers or using the spatula, um, not much different, but absolutely using the spatula is, you know, is going to decrease the contamination at least. It helps, definitely. Uh, this next question is from Irene, who asks, are some preservatives more recommended to be used in some types of packages than others? And maybe I'll extend this to some types of formulas or others, and why? Yeah, it's the packaging is another key uh, thing is the, you know, when you formulate and put the, your product out there for the preservative, vision perspective so it's uh, definitely packaging is takes an important role uh to for the avoiding the cross-contamination 
Uh, this next question is from uh, Jaya Shri, who asks, should we add a preservative in an oil-based product? And maybe I'll just like extend this. Like, is preservation something that we have to think about? Because there's this idea floating about that, well, it's water-free, therefore it doesn't need a preservative. Therefore, we don't have to preserve the product. Thoughts? Uh, as you know, of course, anywhere in the water, you need to preserve the product. But that doesn't mean if product doesn't have a water, not need the preservative. It's also there is, you know, uh, you really, again, the previous question someone asked, you really want to avoid the cross-contamination. I think even the product has no water and in some respect uh, needs a preservative. And that's all the time we have for this Q&A. It flies by with only five minutes. Thank you so much, Aisel, for, Aisel, sorry, for uh, contributing to this presentation. And with that, we move on to the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for everybody's time. I'm here with Dr. Mara, better known as Dermatology, and we're going to talk about skin from a dermatological perspective. So before we start, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Hi, Michelle, and hi, everyone who's listening in. I'm Dr. Mara. I'm a dermatologist, a dermatopathologist, and I have a master's in clinical trials. Can you tell us a little bit about what dermatologists do? So dermatologists are medical doctors, and we specialize in diseases of the hair, skin, nails, and mucous membranes. That means those are the wet areas of the mouth and the genital areas. So if you can see here, that is how long I've trained. It's pretty intense, several years. And that helps me and other dermatologists diagnose and treat more than 3,000 diseases of the hair, skin, nails, and mucous membranes. It also helps us address cosmetic concerns. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of what the structure of skin actually is? I have a friend, my skin plushie, and we're gonna explain it using this. So the skin has three layers. You have the epidermis, which is the topmost part of the skin. And then you have the dermis in the middle and the hypodermis at the bottom. So the epidermis is also multi-layered. It's actually quite a thin layer. And the most important part in terms of skincare is the stratum corneum. So here, the stratum corneum is made up of flattened dead cells called the corneocytes. The corneocytes actually originate from the basal layer of the epidermis, and they slowly go up and they're progressively shed and replaced every two to three weeks. The basal layer contains the stem cells, which give rise to keratinocytes, which are the skin cells. And you can also find the melanocytes in this layer, which are the cells producing pigment. The epidermis also has immune cells that fight against infection and also sensory receptors that detect touch. Now, the dermis, which is the middle part, it's actually the thickest part of the skin. It provides the skin with strength, flexibility, and elasticity. It's mostly made up of the proteins collagen and elastin, and they're surrounded by a ground substance, which can bind a lot of water. You can also see hair follicles in the dermis, a network of blood vessels, as well as oil glands and, or you call them sebaceous glands, and your sweat glands. Here at the bottom of the dermis is the hypodermis. It's a layer of fat and connective tissue. It provides protection, insulation, and also acts as energy storage. So given that structure, how does that tell us how we can treat the skin? And also, how do we deal with different skin conditions? Where are they in this anatomy? So skin conditions differ in several factors, all of which impact treatment selection. So one of the first things we consider as a dermatologist is what area of the skin is affected. Is it the epidermis? Is it only the stratum corneum? Is it the dermis or even the hypodermis? Are there specific cells affected? For example, melanocytes or immune cells? Are there specific structures affected? For example, the hair follicles. So these things come into play. Another thing we consider is how did the disease develop or originate? So that's called etiopathogenesis. Is this because of a genetic abnormality? Is it immune mediated or autoimmune? Is it a malignancy? Is it an infection? Another thing to consider is how much of the skin is involved. Is it generalized like all over? Is it only a few areas of the skin? Is it just localized? And lastly, you also want to check, has the patient responded 
or not respond to specific treatments in the past. Now, generally speaking, if the skin condition is restricted to the upper layers of the skin, like the stratum corneum, the upper layers of the epidermis, topical products are enough. It's also pretty much the same thing if the areas of the skin affected are just localized. However, if you have large surface areas affected, or if the skin condition is a little bit more multifactorial, more complicated in pathogenesis, or if this patient already had a bad response to treatment or minimal response in the past, you would like to add other things. So many skin diseases actually exist as a spectrum in terms of severity. So I always talk to my patients about treatment options as if you're climbing up a ladder. At the bottom of the ladder are the gold standards of treatment for that condition. That's usually topical. Now, if you have treatment failure or you're just not happy with a response, you could always go up the ladder so that you can try second line and third line treatments. One of the conditions I like talking about in social media is melasma. And the thing about melasma is it's so multifactorial. You have the pathogenesis in all layers of the skin. So you have epidermis, Dermis, not the hypodermis though. So when you are applying medication, some of them target only the epidermis, some of them go deeper into the dermis, and then you have sun protection, which also, as you know, it's not really a medication, but it's the cornerstone of melasma treatment. So all of these things can be given to a single patient. And sometimes a patient will ask me, Dr. Mara, why am I not treated with a single drug? Like if it's an infection, I'm given an antibiotic. Why am I having so many procedures, so many treatments? And that's the explanation. Because some skin diseases are multifactorial, so I have to attack it in different ways. So according to dermatologists, what would be the basics of managing your skin? So I have so many people experiencing skincare FOMO. They think the only way to take care of your skin is to have this very fancy skincare routine with a lot of actives. But my advice is generally threefold. You want to prevent address and maintain. In terms of prevention, you don't even need to do anything extremely fancy. You really just don't want to cause damage to your skin as much as possible. And it can be as simple as keeping your skin clean, keeping it hydrated and not drying it out and protecting it from the sun. So just select a cleanser that fits your skincare type and your needs and then moisturize if you need it. Use a sunscreen regularly and supplement that with sun protection measures. Now, if you already have skin conditions or concerns you want to address, then that's when you start bringing in actives. The reality is, if you have a mild skin condition restricted to the epidermis, OTC drugs and cosmetics probably can already help. However, beyond that, you probably need to see someone like me, a dermatologist who can prescribe medications and do in-office procedures if needed. And lastly, maintain. I see this a lot in patients. Once they achieve their skincare goals or their skin is clear, they stop everything they've been doing. Now, please do not do this, especially if a dermatologist or a doctor prescribed you this medication. Ask, ask first if you can stop it. Because many times we are going to need to maintain that because the skin can still develop problems in the future and you are now using the maintenance step so that you don't need to address too many things. And always, always supplement your skincare routines with a healthy lifestyle. Your skin will thank you for that. And finally, what are some common misconceptions that you would like to debunk? Oh, I have five. The first one is cosmetics are always enough. Now, as you remember from the skin structure discussion we had, cosmetics actually, now they differ in the depth of penetration and the site of action. But generally speaking, they pretty much work on top, on the stratum corneum and the upper layers of the epidermis. So beyond that, you might need a little more help from topical drugs. Now, always remember that cosmetics are not as tightly regulated as drugs, so set expectations. They may be helpful, but they can't do everything. Number two, oh, this one, I hate it. Cosmetics are useless. Now, I really take offense at this statement because in my own clinical practice, I've seen how cosmetics can impact my patient's management. Now, a product or ingredient doesn't need to be a drug to work on skin. And not everyone has a medical condition that needs a drug. Not everyone can even tolerate or access drugs. So I really feel that cosmetics, if you have a healthy set of expectations and understand what it's supposed to do for your skin, and it can do a lot, really. I just want to highlight that some cosmetic ingredients are studied better than others. So it can always be a better starting point for people who want to target specific skin concerns. And that's a discussion for another time. The third one is that dermatologists know everything about skin and it's, you know, it's care. That is just not true. 
Dermatologists are medical doctors. As I've mentioned, we are experts in skin, hair, nail, and mucous membrane diseases. However, cosmetic formulation, cosmetic chemistry, cosmetic regulation, that is not in our wheelhouse at all. In fact, much of what I know about skincare came from people like Michelle. My very first book on cosmetics was Michelle's ebook. And I got into skincare because of Michelle. I just want to say that out loud. I'm so proud that Michelle brought me into this beautiful, amazing world that I would have never really understood if I just based it from dermatology textbooks. And number four, dermatologists know nothing about cosmetics on the flip side. So this really depends on the derm. Some dermatologists do, you know, they go the extra mile to try to understand. We basically have... Um, good knowledge of how the skin performs, the anatomy, the physiology, and also how cosmetics could potentially work because we get that part of the framework. However, you have to go a little bit, a little bit deeper to understand more. So that's when reading journals, reading books, talking to experts, learning from experts, all of these things can make a dermatologist better understand cosmetics. I also want to highlight our own personal experience with cosmetics and our patients' Uh, reviews and what they tell us work for them. All of these things can make a dermatologist understand cosmetics better. And lastly, skin is always the same. The skin reacts the same way. This I really want to highlight because I've seen so many patients, even the same skin condition can manifest differently on different patients, different colors. It would look different on a patient who is dark skinned or lighter skinned. And the same treatment for conditions you will also have different responses from different patients. So basically, all of that just means treatment should always be individualized depending on the patient. Thank you so much for your presentation. And now for our audience, it's time for the question. Thank you so much to Dr. Mara for that fantastic, informative presentation. Unfortunately, Mara is sick, but we'll still be able to answer your questions. So if you guys keep putting your questions in the chat, we will eventually get to them on our Instagram page with Mara's answers. And now we're going to take a few minute break before our closing panel. So stay tuned. We will be back at the top of the hour, whichever hour you're on, uh, with our closing panel on science communication in cosmetics.
And now I'm in a different seat as a panelist. And for the moderator for this conversation, we have Dr. Akemi Uka from the Independent Beauty Association for sustainability in cosmetics. In my opinion, there's no smarter person in the industry than Akemi. <laughs> but with that, I will hand the mic over to Akemi to moderate this panel. Yes, thank you, Jen. Uh, my name is Akemi Oka. I head up the Supply Chain and Sustainability Resources Group at the Independent Beauty Association. We're a trade association um, for small to mid-sized independent businesses in the, in the beauty sector. Um, I am very pleased to welcome the panelists for this closing session, and, and we're going to talk specifically about science communication. So I'd like to uh, welcome, uh, you've heard um, certainly Jen and Michelle's bios and backgrounds as, as our hosts today, but let me introduce uh, Mark Strom. So um, Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and maybe where people can find you? Yeah, sure. So I am a board certified dermatologist. I practice in New York City, and I do a range of kind of medical, surgical, and cosmetic um, dermatology. So, you know, I take care of things that affect the skin, hair, nails, and mucous membranes. Um, I also make content kind of related to dermatology, skincare, things like that on TikTok and Instagram. Um, you can find me at, at Dermarcologist, um, and I've been doing that for about three years now. Excellent, excellent. So, we're going to talk a little bit about um, science communication, which um, is frankly just more important than ever, I think, um, just given the, the prevalence of information and trying to understand what is uh, what is actual true information and, and what, what may be a miss or disinformation. So let's start with what is science communication? I'm going to uh, direct this to Michelle. So can you, can you walk us through what is science communication? Sure. So science communication is a pretty broad bucket. So the main focus is mostly activities that involve communicating science to the wider public. So non scientists, a lot of this is what we call outreach. Um, with traditional science communication, a lot of this was about journalists communicating new scientific findings. So in newspapers or on TV, things like science documentaries, so things like David Attenborough. Um, also, a lot of science communicators tended to go to schools and do scientific demonstrations. So you might remember things like making slime with some random people who turned up at your school one day. Um, but these days, I think with social media, there's been like this new horizon of science communication that's opened up. Um, so now there's a lot of scientists and doctors on social media talking about um, lots of different scientific topics. Sometimes it's breaking down misconceptions. Sometimes it's talking about breaking news. So things like um, vaccines was a big thing. Um, also things like um, the weight loss drug, which the name of which has now suddenly slipped my head. Um, okay. Also things like just warning people about not um not eating tide pods things like that but as well as that there's also things like um scientists on youtube making youtube videos on TikTok, on instagram making infographics um on podcasts also even like twitch streams i know a couple of science communicators who just like do science on stream and lots of people watch them so yeah it's a very very broad brush and of course um events like this as well fantastic so it sounds like there's just a broad um, sort of collection of, of vehicles to communicate science today. And that's a little bit different from maybe like what it used to be in the past. Um, let's talk about why it's important. So um, Jen, why, why is it important to communicate about science? I think there's many layers to this. For one, as we've already talked about, there's a lot of misinformation. And I think part of that is that accurate information is kind of hard to find. Science is also complex. It's getting more and more inaccessible as well, I would say. Uh, we have paid publishing and all of that, but also science in general is becoming more complex. So it's hard to access that as the general person at home. And so science communication can help break some of those barriers to help overcome misinformation. So misinformation and addressing it is one of the reasons I would say. Another thing is in cosmetics, 
consumer sentiment drives what happens in the cosmetics industry. And so if everyone's misinformed, then how do you actually productively move forward? But this really extends far past cosmetics because when the general public is misinformed, when the general public does not have the right information, when there's polarization also in the general public, then it gets really hard to really do anything. So cited by the World Economic Forum, misinformation is a core geopolitical and technological risk globally. And so it's really important for us to start addressing this for like health uh, security, for like how we're actually like voting for politicians, how we're addressing climate change and so on and so forth. And so this is one of the reasons or another reason why science communication is very important. Yeah, from from your perspective, Mark, like, why do you think that um, science communication is important? I mean, definitely, I think uh, we can dig into some of what Jen talked about, but I'm curious to know as as a um, a person in the medical profession, too, like, why do you think science communication is important? Yeah, I mean, I think going back to misinformation, I think, you know, even something that may seem like a benign mistruth kind of often will trickle down to affect people's health in various ways. So two examples that I think I've seen a lot recently are kind of like sunscreen related. So there's this kind of myth that goes around almost based on junk science that certain like sunscreens are endocrine disruptors and kind of how that affects people's health is they'll just, a lot, often people will stop wearing sunscreen because they're afraid to use sunscreen. Um, you know, I think another thing that I've seen recently on social media is, um, so there's an oral medication that I might use to treat a patient with acne called isotretinoin. And there's a lot of kind of mistruths about the science behind that on social media, where I see a lot of people saying like, oh, it's a, ke it's a chemotherapy medication. Like, why would you use that? Like, we shouldn't be giving that to people for acne. When the science behind that is like, yeah, like certain, you know, uh, when used in a different way, like theoretically, it could act as that type of medication. But in the doses that we use to treat acne, like um, that, that's not really how it acts. And so, you know, maybe that's like a little bit more of a um, benign, I guess, um, type of misinformation where it would just lead someone to not seek a treatment rather than get a cancer. You know, I think um, both are important nonetheless. Just kind of building a little bit, Jen, on on your comment around sort of the availability of information and the complexity of science. Like, do you, you know, I think the availability of information has been quite interesting for consumers at large and the general public to understand. But, um, you know, the the science piece of that and and how you read a scientific paper or understand good data from maybe, maybe, um, you know, less complete data is challenging. So, um, you know, how do you tackle getting information out when science is often nuanced? Science is based on, you know, how good your data or your study was set up, or, you know, it, it may be, um, you know, trying to, trying to force the shades of gray into a very black and white communication world, especially on short formats, like, Twitter or TikTok, you know, how do you, how do you sort of um, try to get across some of the um, the back and forth that is natural to science um, in a world that wants very black and white answers? This reminds me of a study that was published in, I think it was 2021 by O'Brien et al. I could have the dates wrong, but it was kind of addressing this point around like, trying to get people to trust that this statement that I'm telling you is science and science is fact is challenging. Um, instead, a more productive strategy for science communication generally looks at like teaching people more the scientific process so that they understand that things evolve. And, and so that's probably a better way to arm your audience so that as information changes, then they can change their mind accordingly and appreciate the nuance of science and how information is just always evolving. I would be really interested in, yeah, the rest of the panelists' perspective on this. But I think a really important strategy for any science communicator to do is to in include information about like science 
literacy, like what makes good evidence? Because that's a really broad conversation. Just because there's a study published does not necessarily mean that study is good evidence and there's predatory journals. And like as a consumer, how do you know any of this? Just because it's an animal study doesn't necessarily mean that effect is going to be seen in a person just because a, there was a person in a study doesn't mean that that result will actually be replicated and replication is what makes good evidence it's really confusing as a consumer so like um teaching about science literacy or like a scientific process but also critical thinking i think those two should also be included in any kind of scientific uh science communication strategy yeah let me just ask michelle uh, since you're also sort of in this space like how how do you bridge that gap? Because I think you're able to also very clearly articulate really complex topics. And, um, you know, for an audience that has maybe varied science background. So how do you how do you tackle whether it's science literacy or helping walk people through some critical thought? Yeah, I think what Jen said is really true. Um, being able to teach people critical thinking skills is really important and like strategies for dealing with new information. Um, from just like a communicating complex concepts perspective, uh, my background is very much in education. Um, I still teach a class of 17 year olds um, for three hours a week and it's after school. So they're very tired and they have a short attention span. So I think with a lot of practice with that, I've managed to get that down. But I think also, I think a lot of people, when they look from outside, science communication looks easy when it's done well. Um, we do spend hours and hours. So I personally spend about 20 to 80 hours for a single YouTube video, which is about 10 minutes long. Um, yeah, so it is difficult. You do have to go through and digest the science properly and then think about how to formulate it. Um, and I think a lot of it does just come from practice. So for any budding science communicators out there, I highly recommend practicing. So just explaining things, taking any opportunity you have to um, maybe try teaching, but also just explaining things to maybe your parents, to your siblings, to your friends. And that sort of practice is really invaluable. Yeah, that's actually great advice. I remember having to teach uh, when I was uh, getting my PhD, having to teach, it was chemistry for non-chemists. and I really had to think differently about how to explain some of these concepts to an, uh, you know, a student group that in a class that just didn't have all of the sort of embedded knowledge around like some of the more uh, higher level chemistry concepts. So, um, but I found it like challenging and actually kind of fun in a way. So, um, so I, I can understand sort of the the time with the seventeen year olds actually is really really helpful, you know, in trying to to dissect down and and uh and share information let me um uh, mark you mentioned something earlier about just sort of this some of the misconceptions that you hear you know based uh, you know especially in the medical field where people hear about a drug or an active and then it's applied someplace else but you know as, as you're doing science communication work like what are i'll ask all of you this too but what are some of the challenges you faced in doing um and sharing science communication yeah i think and i think um i think michelle does like a fantastic job of kind of uh, um simpling down a really complex scientific topic into a really digestible she just she just makes it look so easy and i think i've really like struggled with that on social media because science is complicated and you know there's you know it's often not like completely black and white and that's what i find that social you know people on social media are often looking for they want a black and white answer they want to be told like this is good this is bad and often there's just a lot of like in between in the middle of that so i think you know those are some of the challenges i've really faced and i've you know some ways i've kind of like helped myself become a more effective communicator is really focusing on you know small like very small digestible topics at a time you know i'm mainly a content creator on tiktok so most of my videos are going to be like a minute or less and it's you really have to be limited in the scope of what you talk about in one video so you're really just focusing on a small portion of one thing you want to get one main point across um so i think that has been really really helpful for me to be a more effective like communicator to my viewers probably like the most you know probably like what i've probably like the most helpful tip that i've had to come up with myself is really like being succinct about things 
Right. Uh, Jen, what are some of the challenges you face doing science communication? I would say the challenges kind of evolved as my platform grew. When I first got started, uh, I had a lot of people who vocally disagreed with me and would post really mean comments on my wall and someone so far to like find where I live and be kind of weird. <laughs> so uh, certainly like harassment among science communicators is not a novel experience, especially if you're posting about more controversial topics. I know a lot. I'm pretty sure Michelle has experienced this as well. I'm not sure about Mark, but a lot of people also in like uh, the agro space, I've heard this from a number of science communicators and health space, certainly, especially with everything going on with COVID. Uh, so that's one of the challenges, especially early on. I did take a strategy of when people are mean to me, I will pin your comments. <laughs> then everyone will see just how mean you are. And then usually people don't do it again. So I have developed good strategies to deal with um, these kinds of obstacles. Uh, another obstacle that I have faced is, well, especially when you first get started, is you're generally doing science communication for free. And so if you are working, um, I've been, I continue to work. I'm currently working as a consultant. Um, so when you're working, then it takes away time from the time you could be making money and so if this is what you're doing i mean like especially like so my business is split between consulting and science communication so it's always kind of a balance of like well i have to make money um and then i have to balance that with uh putting content out which i think is really important and this is the direction that i'm trying to grow my platform and so as i've grown my platform so like talking about the evolution of my uh, challenges i started getting sponsorship for some of my content the summits never have been like a huge deal for people but whenever i do sponsored content online i have a different strategy than most influencers in that like i will not do a product review just because like i I, it's just not what I'm about. I don't really want to encourage people to buy more. People should just do whatever they want. And what I like probably is not going to be what other people like. So like everyone could just do you. And when I do uh, sponsorship content, I always just make sure it it's very educational and that's really it. I will not promote a product in my social media. So like it's hard for people to justify working with me as an influencer. I, I totally appreciate it. But those few times that I've done it, the comments, even though I'm not promoting a product, is like the top comments are like, oh, you're just a shill for PNG. How can we just anything that you're saying? So like you have to make money for science communication, but then people just like don't want to see you make money or something. It's it's this attitude for sponsorship that I think that there's a little bit more nuance for sponsorship and content creators and some people really realize like at the end of the day for us to make this viable sustainable for our lives we do have to make money so figuring out strategies to do that while still keeping true to the things that we believe I mean that's something that any science communicator has to has to overcome that's great we may come back to that uh conversation um Michelle what is uh what are some of the challenges you faced doing uh the science communication work you do I think Jen and Mark have both covered a lot of what I was going to say. So yeah, the time, effort, money kind of conundrum is a really big one. Like I said, it takes so many hours to make a YouTube video. Um, and yeah, it's not viable without sponsorship or some sort of income or unless you're like stinking rich, I'm sure that works as well, but I am not, unfortunately. So yeah, that is always a challenge. Um, the thing that Mark said about making something catchy enough for social media is such a big challenge. Mm. Um, and honestly, I think Mark does a really good job of hopping on trends. I think that is something that a lot of science communicators, including me, need to get better at because, yeah, sometimes you do need to have the right bait for people to come and then they end up stumbling on the science. So with social media algorithms, there's a lot of stuff where you basically have to hook the viewer in the first three seconds. And with science, it is really hard to do that. Um, just because of the complexity and because you can't just make stuff up, obviously. Um, I guess like a challenge that has been specific to me, apart from the hate comments that Jen mentioned, um, I think sometimes I get told I'm really mean when I debunk things. Um, I don't know if it's because I'm female and Asian and I'm kind of expected to be like a bit more demure and like, I don't know, shy and retiring and just very, very, very polite. Um, but yeah, I 
don't think I'm that mean. Usually when I'm mean, I think it's when people should know better or they do know better. So when um, like scientists and doctors maybe are promoting chemophobia, um, which I think is very strongly linked to anti-vax. Um, yeah, so a lot of that chemophobia is literally the same logic that um, anti-vaxxers promote things like there's aluminium or mercury or formaldehyde in your vaccines. That is actually exactly the same thing as clean beauty. So yeah, um, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of challenges. I think the biggest challenge though, I think all of us would probably agree is just trying to beat out misinformation. There's just so much misinformation out there and like science communicators are kind of almost fighting, like we're swimming upstream. We're really not getting a lot of help. Like it's always way, way harder to undo that damage. While we're on this subject, I'll just stay with you for a minute. And then I'm going to ask the others too, because I actually think that's a really interesting point. Like why, why do you think misinformation has the traction that it does? That is a really good question. I feel like a lot of us have stumbled a lot upon like the same explanations, but um, the big ones for me are, I think misinformation really hooks into emotions. So first off, it's usually a lot easier to understand than science, which is complex. It appeals to a lot of biases. So for example, um, appeal to nature, it's always like natural things are safer, that sort of chemophobia. And that becomes a really good formula for virality because um, people like content that makes them feel smart, makes them feel like they are justified in what they already believe. So confirmation bias. Um, so that makes it inherently more shareable, more likable, um, and people will create more content like that. They'll be inspired by what they see. There's also the whole sort of fear aspect. Fear is a really strong emotion. We all have that reptile brain in us where we just do not want to die. We don't want to be using dangerous things on ourselves. And yeah, as well as that sort of instinct, that instinct first off overrides any sort of rational thinking you have. Um, and secondly, it makes it really shareable because I think deep down, most people are good people. We don't want to hurt ourselves. We don't want our family members to be using something dangerous. So we're gonna be sharing stuff we come across that looks like it might help pe other people. Um, and again, social media algorithms is something gets shared that really boosts in the algorithm. Um, and also, I think there's just the big thing where it just takes a lot less time to make um, misinformed content. Obviously, you don't need to read as deeply. You can just like stumble across the first thing you see and share that. Um, it's also, there's also just a lot more people who can make it as well. So um, with science, like you need the training and that already uh, shrinks the pool of content creators really massively. Whereas with misinformation, anyone can open up, for example, an app and just scan ingredients and just go, wow, look at this. It says it's 98% terrible for you. Um, yes, yeah, so I think those are some of the big ones. I'm sure Jen and Mark have other things to add. Yeah, Mark, what uh, just um, from your perspective, like why, why is it that misinformation just seems to stick better, spread more? Um, you know, what are what are you seeing in, in the kind of um, communication that you do and what you have to dispel? Um, so I think first there's just like a huge flood of it. So kind of as Michelle was talking about, it's so easy to make a really quick misinformed kind of shock value video, you know, sometimes even just a few minutes and then it's already posted. Whereas it takes much longer to make a well-cited video or something like that, like debunking that one to two minute um, myth. You know, um, so it's really hard if, you know, for example, Michelle says it can take 20 to 80 hours to make like a 10 minute YouTube video where everything is well cited and she's done a lot of research. You can't, you, know, you can't feasibly make that type of debunking video for every like really quick misinformed video that's out there. So that's one thing. Um, you know, I think misinformation has a lot of shock value as well. So based, you know, on social media where everything is so based on engagement and how long someone is watching without scrolling away, the shock value, like this is going to give you cancer or, you know, cosmetics are dangerous, that type of videos and get a lot more traction and views, um, than, uh, you know, a, you know, like a well-cited informed video, which doesn't really have that kind of shock factor at the beginning type of thing. Um, so I'd say that those are probably like the main two things that I've seen at least. 
Interesting. Jen, do you have anything to add? It's hard to build on uh, both Michelle and Mark's answers. They are very thorough, but maybe I'll come at it from like the algorithm perspective on top of what they were talking about. And Michelle alluded to a lot of this, but what performs best in the algorithm is what people are like, people have a bias towards, but additionally, what performs best are short sound bites like a 10 second or less soundbite, which is really challenging for me because my most viral content was like a, a, a sentence. But then I feel bad as a, like a scientist, of like, well, that, that doesn't give every, like all the information. You can't make a nuanced sentence. Like you can't give all the information in that one sentence. And so as a result, the content that performs better in the algorithm are those short soundbites that are not nuanced and typically are are checking all the boxes for biases, so more shareable. Uh, yeah, and then, yeah, with the algorithm, people also tend to get like uh, funnels into echo chambers. So then once people start seeing some of this content and in, like interacting with it, then they are seeing more and more of it. So like more human biases come into play because you see all this information and you're like, yeah, I must be right. All this information is like agreeing with me, but they're just only seeing a small portion of the information on the internet based off of how the algorithm is kind of funneling them. And so then on the flip side for, for science communicators, I think it's hard to like get outside of your echo chamber. The people that follow me, like I will also say it, in my time doing science communication, another factor that might come in other than me pinning people's comments that are mean to me is I think less people who disagree with me are seeing my content, which is nice for my like well-being, my mental well-being, but probably horrible <laughs> for the like grand picture of science communication or like accessibility for this information to the everyday person if they're just not seeing it. That's actually really interesting, you know, just talking about wanting to expand beyond sort of uh, the people who are already well informed, you know, how do you talk with other people who may be getting um, information that's just sort of stuck in this echo chamber? I, I am kind of curious, you know, we, we might talk about how we can um, get more traction with accuracy, because it sounds like from all of you that it's just harder to um to try to communicate accurate information and misinformation but just um, just really briefly before we go into that is like do you think that um th there are so many influencers on Instagram, TikTok, you know, um YouTube uh, particularly in beauty. And so I I'm curious to know if you think that um there's a, a more prevalent misinformation issue in beauty um, or do you think that this is sort of across the board? I, I know we, we've talked about, um, you know, health and vaccines, but um, I, I just, I don't know how many other areas where there's like just the level of self-prescribed influencers that can just basically start up from nothing and start talking about things. So I'm just kind of curious, um, maybe I can start with you, Jen, but you know, what, what do you think about like beauty in particular? Um, is there some more misinformation here or do you just not know? Well, I think like with anything kind of related to health, with anything that we interact with a lot, there's more opportunity for this kind of feel fearful information to take traction. Like, I don't know, probably not going to be so concerned about phones granted people are concerned with like brain cancer and using phones so i don't know but like that's another health thing you know so anything that's related to our overall well-being i feel like there is more opportunity and then maybe to to compound this in cosmetics unlike for food which people view as like this we need to do it every day we need to eat <laughs> granted like there's a lot of misinformation in food but i think like a difference that's maybe unique to cosmetics is that people have a misperception that cosmetics are just this superficial thing that we do that we really don't need to do it so therefore it's an easy thing for us to just avoid 
And so therefore cosmetics are just like an easy, I would say they're an easy scapegoat for like, you look at the news headlines for so many different topics and it's always cosmetics that are the problem. And then when you actually go and dig into it, it's like, it's not cosmetics. Like for example, there's all this talk about phthalates and endocrine disruption and so then the media paints it as a cosmetics industry cosmetics are making sperm uh, sperm counts drop cosmetics like there was something so bold of like cosmetics are making your babies fat a daily mail a few years ago that was an actual headline or like this is going to lead to the extinction extinction of the human uh human species cosmetics like do you think cosmetics are going to do this and but then you go and see that it's linked back to phthalates but then they're making like generalized statements about phthalates as a group not recognizing that the only phthalate that's relevant to cosmetics largely is diethyl phthalate that has a very good safety track record demonstrably not endocrine disrupting in the context of cosmetics so like it's not the issue and then you go and dig in a little bit more into phthalate issues and like the challenge is more is like indoor pollution food packaging not cosmetics the wire cosmetics a scapegoat i would come back to it's because people view it as this like superficial thing that we don't really need that's actually super interesting like i almost want to dig into go down a little rabbit hole there uh, before I do. Um, just, uh, you know, Mark or Michelle, do either of you have any thoughts around um, sort of the the beauty industry and whether it's a little more susceptible or to misinformation or just has a little bit more than other categories? Or do you just not want to weigh in because you're not in these other areas? Either of you can start. Michelle, maybe. Um. Yeah, I think... To add on to what Jen said, I think um, beauty and cosmetics is a bit of a walled garden. So the cosmetics industry has never really been that open with their data. Um, there's a, so much of the science is actually done within industry and it's not done in peer reviewed journals like a lot of other topics, especially medicine. I guess drugs um, and medications are sort of like the partner of cosmetics. And so there's like just such a big difference between how much information there is on both of them that's open to the public. Um, I think there's also, um, also because maybe it's a more feminized sort of area, there's just sort of just been this misogyny over the years where um, the industry has kind of assumed that women just don't care about science, they just want to be sold a dream, they just want to be sold, you know, the celebrity endorsement. Um, if you wear this, you will suddenly be really successful, you'll have all these men falling over you. Um, and that's sort of come through in the advertisements rather than actually, um, I guess you could contrast it with things like, I don't know, cars, um, which is a more masculine area. I mean, they are still selling the dream, but they will say, you know, technical things about it. And then people will be interested in those and Google them. So I think that sort of aspect that like technical interest has um, grown a lot with social media and the internet, but it's still not quite there. Um, yeah, I think another thing that um, I can't remember who told me this, but I thought it was so smart. So this is not my idea, but um, I think cosmetics have also suffered a bit because of um, transparency, because we have an inky list, like we have the ingredient list on the back of the packaging versus, let's say, laundry detergent um, or other household things. Um, because those names are there, those scary long words are on the packaging for consumers to read and by law they have to be a particular font size as well so you can't really not read it i think that in itself has really stirred a lot of chemophobia and it's just kind of given people more stuff to pick on like more stuff to think about and google so yeah i think that has also added to it and i think i'll also have one more thing i'm sure um hopefully i haven't taken all of mark's points but um i just also wanted to add um there are some examples from history and those examples are just really nice and vivid. So things like um, women dying from putting on too much lead makeup. Um, and that's sort of like, you are so vain that you're gonna die. Um, you're happy to die to look beautiful. That sort of myth is just really, really, um, it's just really attractive. Like it's a really cool myth to have like a really good story. And so I think that's really dug into our brains. Thanks. Mark, I'm going to 
you might have some some comments on this, but I'm going to move us on just to kind of a different question, which is you talked about how difficult it is to just sort of like make that snappy, you know, in the first like, you know, three seconds, like that sort of making that content interesting, like how, I mean, accuracy just seems to not get the, the same kind of traction. What what have you done to try to, um, you know, give accurate information that traction and get people's attention with sort of the right the right information? Yeah, kind of like I was saying, it is pretty tough to do that, um, especially because, you know, an accurate video, kind of like we were saying earlier, is not always as often as fearful or flashy as some of the misinformation out there. Um, you know, I think one of the things I've done is I, you know, for a lot of like my videos where I'm going to be going more heavy into like explanation or um <clears throat> talking about the basics of something that's not necessarily that interesting or not, not, I guess not, not that interesting, but just like less flashy, you know, I'll really try to, you know, I'll spend even like most of my time trying to think of like a good hook in the first three seconds of the video. So like, what can I say that is going to draw people or draw the algorithm in, draw, draw the algorithm in, draw the people in so that they actually watch the rest of it. Um, and so, you know, I think really it, when I started focusing more on what can I say in those first three seconds to have people get attached enough to watch the rest of it, I think that has been really helpful for things so far, but it hasn't really sacrificed the integrity of the rest of the video per se. Um, yeah, I think that's probably like what I've tried to do the most. Yeah. How about Jen, you mentioned that, you know, some of your most popular posts have been like one sentence or, you know, a did you know kind of thing. Like how, how have you tried to get more traction with accurate information or, or, or traction around sort of um, debunking some of the uh, misinformation, disinformation that's out there? Uh, well, I try to keep my content short and sweet. Granted, I will say I've kind of fallen off the bandwagon in the last couple of months where I have my own conferences. So the uh, content that I've been publishing on my Instagram lately is probably more geared to industry rather than consumers. And I need to get more into the short and sweet sound bites that consumers will be interested in rather than my like deep uh, dives from my podcasts or conferences. Um, but certainly in the past, short and sweet, myth busting does really well on social media. There's a caveat to that, though, as Michelle said, as soon as you start um, correcting people online, then you're often painted as a bully, which can get really old, especially like when I am addressing misinformation online, I am never saying anything other than like the correction, because that's what matters. These are the points that were inaccurate. And these are the corrections, name calling, you'll never see that or like tone policing, never see that in any of the corrections that I do. But yet, you still have that comment that you're you're just a bully um it's concerning for me because oftentimes for content creators i will reach out to them personally uh i might comment on their uh post granted i do try to avoid commenting directly on the post usually i'll message uh, just because as soon as you engage with the content then you start to prop it up in the algorithm <laughs> so like that's the double-edged sword you want to tell these people that the information that they're posting is wrong and including from like the um general audience like you want to comment you're tempted to comment to tell them that they're wrong, but that really just like helps them. It helps them get more eyes on the content. Um, so yeah, I usually have conversations, but I have found, especially it's like, it's uh, concerning when, especially when I'm, a few times I've done corrections for physicians, uh, for dermatologists, and then they come in to my comments to tell me that I'm a bully. They don't correct their content. And then people will pile on from their page. And be like, You're a bully. I keep and like most people on my feed just because I am in an echo chamber don't do that. But I will have some of those comments that do get old with that strategy. But certainly, it does perform better. Uh, yeah, I'll stop talking there, Michelle. It, it's interesting <laughs> from a from a scientist standpoint, um, and this is something that I think is always is is maybe like harder for the general population to understand is that 
true good scientific debate means that you are talking about the data, the validity of the data, the validity of the results, right? And how did you test? What did you study? What were your standards? What were your controls? What were you looking for? Is there significance in the results, right? And and that's part of a healthy and active scientific debate is that you go back and forth over facts and data. And, um, you know, I, I think sometimes it's very challenging when you have one person who's arguing over this, the data that's central and another person who's arguing the, the person, um, you know, or, or the tone or whatever. And, and so, um, you know, it is, it is hard to just communicate that good scientific discourse means that you talk about it. And then eventually you come to the conclusion, the preponderance of evidence says that this is probably the outcome and this is how we should understand the results. Um, and Can I chime in quick. I just wanted to say wrong. something along this line and it's something that I should have said initially. I think there is an issue with uh, it, it kind of confusing this landscape where like experts speaking outside of their expertise, this happens a lot. And so then you're the relevant expert or at least understand the topic better than this person that maybe doesn't have the relevant expertise. You go and comment, but then I find this, I'm sorry, Mark, uh, I find this especially for dermatologists online, like all, all, um, all types of expertises, there's an issue, but the greater issue with dermatologists is that there's this perception among consumers that maybe is perpetuated amongst many dermatologists, well, not many, some, some very loud minority dermatologists that they are the one true expert. And so then you're this other expertise that's not considered that one true expert coming in to say like, well, this is inaccurate. This is the truth. And then the, the perception among their audience is just it, really, really challenging to overcome, uh, like the bullying stuff. But then also, like, who are you to say that this dermatologist is wrong? They know so much more about skincare than you, the chemist. Yeah, well, it seems like an opportunity to get kind of both of those points of view on the table. You know, someone who has more experience in cosmetic formulation and how those products are are designed to perform and then the dermatologist who's seeing, you know, here's here's what I see, you know, in in my in my practice and and just being able to have that again a um collegial conversation about the two versus like very sort of emotional followers. Um I want to just um I want to pivot a little bit and then um close and then we'll open to questions, but um you know, I was recently in a um I was recently in a conference that that was talking about AI. Um, and I'm very curious to know what you think um, about um, the emergence of artificial intelligence and generative AI and what you think the impact is going to be in terms of spreading misinformation and, and disinformation uh, in this space and others. I mean, I've, I've read stats as much as like 99% of what you could read in the future could just be AI generated content. So um, uh, maybe I'll start with Michelle, like any thoughts about how AI is going to, it could make your job harder or easier because there's some other arguments about how you could use AI to filter out uh, misinformation. But what are your thoughts on that? Um, I'm highly concerned. Um, yeah, I think the problem with AI, especially with things like ChatGPT and things that work like that is that they just take the most common it's almost like they just take the top Google search results and mash them all together. So if there is misinformation, which in beauty, there is a lot of misinformation online, and it is usually the dominant information, then that's just going to get perpetuated. It's just going to perpetuate what is already popular, which is not usually not great. Like we said before, there's just so much more misinformation than there is good, accurate information. Um, having typed in some things into chat GPT, it, it is pretty much just that it's never well-considered information, which makes sense because AI is not a scientist. It is literally just, um, yeah, at the moment, I guess like there is potential if there are ways of getting the AI to be smarter and not just with that sort of predictive text type um, AI. I think there's a bit of potential, but from what I've seen in every area, AI is just not very accurate. Um, I've seen this with um, in dermatology as well, um, with things like trying to spot particular skin conditions. It's just the accuracy is just really not there. 
Um, yeah, I think there is a sort of, I guess there is a sort of first mover advantage that I think all of us on the panel have, which is we already existed before AI became such a big thing. So I think we do have an advantage in that people will trust us more because, you know, our faces existed before generative AI was so big. Um, but yeah, it is really concerning. Um, I really think there needs to be guardrails around that sort of technology. What do you think, Mark? How, how do you think AI is going to uh, play in science communication and in beauty or beyond? Yeah, I think I'm a little concerned about it as well. Um, first of all, going back to what Michelle was saying about the accuracy of AI, I've also found, you know, I've done a little, um, you know, I've done some work with like chat GPT and trying to see what it could be useful for. And I haven't found it to be particularly accurate as well, other than, you know, it seems to be okay at like summarizing information that's in the literature. So for example, if you ask like chat GPT, like, oh, like what are good acne treatments? It's good at like summarizing the kind of like general recommendations for acne. So like the ingredients that should be used and the oral medications and things like that. Um, but beyond that, you know, I haven't really found it helpful at like doing other things in particular. Um, you know, I think part of the thing that I'm a little bit more concerned about AI is more of like the almost like impersonation aspects where, you know, eventually I think I'm not sure if we're quite there where it's like accessible to have AI generate like an impersonation of someone. But, you know, in the future, I'm sure we're going to have issues where, you know, you have an AI generated figure that looks like Michelle and they're saying something on TikTok that's unreasonable and uh, um, it's going to be hard to like figure out if that's real or not. Um, I've all, I've, I've personally already kind of run into issues where like these bot accounts or someone like steals my likeness or like a video that I made about something and kind of edits it in a way to make it look like I'm endorsing something that I'm not. So there was one that went but pretty viral like last year and it got like 50,000 followers on TikTok and millions of views where it was like me kind of reacting to this like fat loss product and uh, it took forever for me to get that taken down by TikTok so I think you know that type of problem I think that AI is just gonna exacerbate as it kind of gets more and more advanced and accessible um, to people. That's super interesting. Jen, what are your thoughts about um, the influence of AI? Uh, I feel like it, it's hard to cover more than what Mark and Michelle have covered already for especially the downsides because yeah, for you to use many of these AI tools, say like ChatGPT, you have to like critically look at the information that it's giving you because it will give you information based off of what's widely on the internet, which oftentimes, especially for some of these more controversial polarized areas is incorrect. I will say though, as like in my research, I do use uh, AI tools to help streamline my research a few examples like there's this um there's this ai platform called connected papers that helps give you like a map of research and so me as a researcher i can go look at this one study and then see all the studies that are related to it so that i can have like kind of a path of like this is where this fits in with the research and these are all the other things that i have to read you can also use ChatGPT to like help better understand a study. Um, you obviously have to be um, very uh, like critical about the information that it's uh, dishing out to you. But for example, like if you don't understand something that's in the methods, you can like ask a very specific answer and get or a question and get a very specific uh, answer for you for this paper. But it's like you know. I am coming at it from like, I'm already critical of the information that's going to give me. And that's a very specialized use for it. That is very helpful for, for people who are doing research, but for like the general public who maybe aren't as critical because maybe they don't have the same tools to critically assess, uh, especially if you're talking about science. I think that there is a lot of negatives that can come out of it as well, obviously, as mentioned 
previously. Well, let me um let me just ask with the that sort of leads us to maybe the last question, and maybe I'll just ask um maybe I'll ask Michelle um do you have suggestions to the audience for how to navigate information online? That's a really good question. And um, I think all of us have sort of touched on this already, but um, yeah, no one can really learn every single topic. No one has the time. It would take lifetimes to learn every topic well enough to be able to critically evaluate it. So it's all about information literacy. So my favorite information literacy tool is called SIFT. It's developed by Mike Caulfield um, and it's an acronym. So S stands for stop. Um, so if you have a strong emotional reaction to a piece of information, then you should stop and pause and don't share it at that point, because a lot of misinformation, like we said before, is purposely designed to make you scared and hook into those like um, very gut emotions and override any sort of rational thinking. Then there's I, which stands for investigate the source. So this is like Googling um who is giving you this information i mean we all we can't necessarily evaluate the information unless we have that expertise but i think we can all kind of evaluate how sus the source is reasonably well so things like reading up about like if they have a wikipedia page um there was an example recently actually on tiktok where when you looked up the person's wikipedia page it had like this giant list of um like court cases where they were found um yeah, they were just committing lots of fraud. So that was a very big red flag that I think a lot of people can easily get to. Um, then after I, it is F, which stands for find better coverage. So look up that topic and see if there are better sources that talk about it and see what they say, whether or not they agree with it. And then finally, there's T, which is tracing the claims. And this is just like Googling what they were saying, look up the original sources for if they're quoting numbers, if they're quoting a study and actually read that original source and see if it's actually presented accurately. Um, so one example I've had recently was someone on TikTok was talking about a study and like you could just go to the study and read it. And a lot of the time you do have to be an expert to understand the study. But in this case, it was literally the sentence that she cut off afterwards. It literally just contradicted everything she was saying. Um, so yeah, sometimes just getting to that stage will already tell you what's going on. So highly recommend looking into that. So again, that was SIFT by Mike Caulfield. There's a whole bunch of um, websites dedicated to this and like going into more detail about how to do things, but yeah, highly recommend that. Love the acronym. Um, I'm just gonna go to some of the questions and I'll, um, we might only have time for a couple um, before we wrap. So first question is, what's your take on how misinformation shaped the beauty skincare market? So, um, Mark, you want to take that one? Um, uh, you know, I think I think someone was covering this earlier, but I think a lot of uh, you know product development and things like that um, are based off of not necessarily the science, but kind of consumer perception of the science. So, in particular, I think one of the things that I've seen most frequently is a lot of products now are being formulated without parabens, which generally, in my understanding of the evidence, are a very safe preservative system, very effective preservative system. And yet now a lot of products are being formulated without them because the um, misinformation around them has kind of shaped consumer perception of them and that they're less likely to buy products with parabens in them. And I think that kind of trickles down more to um, you know, I, I forget who was talking about earlier, but there, you know, I, I think more and more I've seen that there are just like products on the market without well-formulated preservative systems in them. So you'll buy them and then they'll go bad really quickly. Or I've seen videos on TikTok where even just when they're opening them after buying them at wherever, they're already kind of spoiled. Um, I think that's probably the biggest one that I've seen in particular in recent months. Jen, what do you think? Is there uh how has uh, misinformation shaped the beauty and skincare market? Um, well, yeah, just to kind of build off of what Mark was saying, consumer sentiment drives what happens in industry. Uh, companies want to do things that consumers want. I don't know what came first. It's kind of like a chicken and the egg situation with fear mongering, but then consumers started to like it. Just as one example, they looked for more of it brands took that feedback and started doing more of it, more free from claims as an example. This just like positively feedbacks on the misinformation and trends and 
the things that brands are now be held to. So like then you've got like uh, NGOs that have a profound impact in the industry more than I think a lot of people realize. For example, with EWG being a major stakeholder for how certain state laws are like come to fruition. Like that actually is shaping not only product development, but also regulations that are happening. And that is from this feedback loop that we see. And then there's like, there's, there's, uh, there's, um, stores like Sephora, they have their standards that brands have to comply to. And like a store like Sephora, that's accessible for smaller companies, then this is what now brands are kind of be held to. It's hard for them to even be successful without kind of, I would say, pandering to consumer misperceptions and like taking like a corrective approach is really challenging um, because consumers often don't like it. I've had conversations with some of the larger companies who didn't want to go with, for example, some of these free from claims. They ended up doing it because consumers like wouldn't purchase their products. Their sales went lower when they didn't have these free from claims. And then they just tacked on the free from claim. And wow, look how successful this product is because this is what consumers want. So yeah, certainly it's maybe not impacted the industry in the best. And this is, I would say, the opportunity for science communication to kind of turn the needle for course correction. All right, I'm gonna um, just ask you all for like final thoughts. And then um, I don't think we have time for more questions because I know y'all have to wrap up. Um, Michelle, any final thoughts on science communication you wanna impart? Um, I guess just if any, if there are any budding science communicators out there, um, give it a go. Um, it's really fun. It's really rewarding. And obviously, we do need more good science communicators out there, especially in beauty. But I'm biased because obviously beauty is our space. But yeah, just give it a try. Mark, how about you? Any final words of advice or thoughts? Yeah, I kind of agree with that. I, uh, um, I think I spent so much time like thinking about if I should start making content and start talking about that kind of thing on social media. And then after I started, like had no regrets afterwards, probably like one of the most fun, rewarding things I've done professionally for myself. So I would say like, go for it. Um, and then, you know, I think also for consumers out there, um, just going back to that kind of like emotional feeling that you get when you hear a claim about something, just like, you know, take a step back, think about it for a little bit, think critically, um, uh, get information from a wide variety of sources. Um, just, you know, I guess take everything out there with a grain of salt. All right. And Jen, your thoughts, any last, last words of advice or thoughts? I would maybe switch this to make a call to action that science communication needs support. As you learned throughout this conversation, there are a number of obstacles that science communicators need to overcome. So my call to action to industry, like especially if you're not doing active science communication in your marketing, because I get it, it's hard. You can support science communicators. You can, for example, uh, sponsor myth busting campaigns because then that gives us money, which is hard to come by as a science communicator and allows us to do more of it. Um, and then, so yeah, industry, science communicators need support. You can also give us information too, that like some of this information is hard to find even for people who have scientific background, because a lot of it is kind of kept within the walls of various companies, especially the larger ones. So like help us, give us information so that we can do a better job. And then for the audience, as you would have heard, uh, science content typically does not perform as well in social media algorithms. But what you can do to help support our content is to interact with it more. Comment especially, comment with like, not just emojis, like actually comment because that will help boost us in the algorithm and also share our content. Um, that does a lot for us in getting more eyes on our content. Terrific. Well, you know, I have heard the quote that science does not have a content problem. It has a communication problem. So thank you all for trying to tackle that that big uh, that big communication problem for us. I'm going to turn the program back over to 
um, Jen and Michelle, but thank you all. Thank you, Mark, for joining this, this closing panel. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to moderate. And thank you so much to Akemi for agreeing to moderate this panel and to Mark for agreeing to participate in the panel. And obviously, Michelle, Michelle's going to be here. <laughs> thank you, Michelle, for collaborating on this conference with me. I'll say a few words and then pass it off to Michelle. Maybe you'll have more to say after me. Um, I will just give another call to action for you guys watching this conference. If you want to help support the initiative that we're working on, share, share some sound bites from this presentation. Uh, there will be a replay so you can share the whole uh, camp with your audience. Um, we also have uh, blog posts, briefing notes, on the Beauty SciComm website, beautysciecom with two Ms.com. So share that. You can cite some of the uh, information in there and you can start creating content with that. And that would be super helpful for getting more eyes on our content. I just wanted to say a quick thank you again to all of the speakers throughout the day for agreeing to share your expertise for free at our summit and to our uh, sponsors. It's because of both of you that we were able to keep this camp free and accessible to all of you who are watching. And I'll just give you a quick shout out to BASF and Crota, who were our general sponsors, and Naturium, who was our premium sponsor. So thank you, thank you for supporting this initiative. Michelle, do you want to close it out? Yeah, um, also thank you to everyone in the audience for being here with us today and making this event so successful. Um, I hope you got something out of it or hopefully many things out of it. And yeah, we will have more events in the future. So definitely look out for that. You can follow us on at Beauty Psycom 2Ms on Instagram. You can also sign up to our mailing list, which is on the website Beauty Psycom 2Ms dot com 1m um yeah check us out check out what we have on the website we've got a few things on there that we haven't really publicly promoted much yet um and yeah especially if you are a science communicator definitely um, make sure you stay in touch with us because we have some really exciting programs coming up thank you so much and yeah hope you have a good rest of your day <laughs>